uh, we're going to start the select board meeting March 9th, 2020. Um, we, we do have an agenda. Uh, we do have um, several issues I want to take up before I proceed with the agenda, as well as um, with my colleagues' permission, I've already spoken to them about possibly taking one more article um, out of turn. <clears throat> First, uh, I, what I'd like to do is have a moment of silence for um, Lieutenant Paul Dooley, an Arlington resident, uh, police officer, uh, sergeant, lieutenant. Um, he passed away suddenly uh, last week. I met uh, Paul and when his, he and his wife Heather were really involved in Pop Warner cheerleading and football and Heather who had the beautiful, his, I'm not Heather, Teresa who had the beautiful hair, blonde hair up crossing guard down the bottom of Sims Hospital Hill. And Teresa, who I said I would not get involved with Pop Warner at all, quietly, patiently brought me in. And, um, and unfortunately, she passed almost 20 years ago, uh, very untimely, and, and a great miss for that. And, and, the, and the same with Paul. And one thing I can say about Paul, usually saw him first when you came into the police station, always had a smile on his face. Even when he was ticked off, he just had a different smile on his face. Um, but, you know, great man. Um, I feel terrible for the children, Heather and Sean, and the whole Dooley family. Um, so I'll just have a mo moment of silence for uh, Paul Dooley. You know, God bless and rest in eternal peace. Thank you so much. Um, again, before we get to the agenda, because of the current events with the uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, I have some very brief remarks because my part of, of what I'm going to speak to is really in the early uh, phases of planning um, and the town manager has the more salient up to date in terms of what's going on now. Uh, but I will say uh, re regarding the Stratton decision, I do know that the town manager along with members of the Board of Health, the superintendent, teleconferenced, you know, had meetings, spent a long time, probably a couple of hours on exactly what to do, because um, there's been varying opinions in the community. Um, should have done more, maybe, should have done less, but um, I agree with the uh, town manager and superintendent to err on the side of caution um, would be the way to go. It, but the other piece that I wanted to speak to, and it is in the beginning, and we'll have um, more updates in uh, the future chair after April 4th, will take this on uh, his or her a plate platter, so to speak. We have gotten inquiries about town meeting about a week, week and a half ago, started to have a conversations with the manager. Um, there's been an email exchange um, with the town moderator, with the finance committee chairman, uh, Mr. Tosti, Mr. Foskett, um, as well as Adam. We're looking at what town meeting might be at the end of April, um, depending on where we are and what the status is of the coronavirus. Um, there have been discussions about the, the EV system that we use is only in-house. Right now it doesn't have the capability to allow members to be outside of town hall and vote over the internet. So we're looking at um, different possibilities as well as Attorney Heim um, is um, also working on this because we need to make sure we can do the business of town meeting and pass budgets, but to keep everybody safe and healthy. So. Um, if anyone has suggestions, you, you know, feel free to um, send them into the select board office. Um, our staff, Ms. Marr came up with today, you know, if we perhaps look at a section and use the balcony. So there's d different um, ideas going out there. So we're going to make sure that we can have a town meeting. Uh, the town of Arlington will continue to run. And, um, the last thing I would say is if residents need any help, any information, go to the town website. The town manager will give you particulars on that. But that's the most up-to-date, correct um, information. Uh, but I also would say to everyone, you know, check in on your neighbors. Um, if, if you're someone who's decided to self-quarantine, um, if for some reason um, you need help getting supplies, getting food, getting meals, um, you know, feel free to contact the town hall through the town website. There's groups. There's also groups because Arlington's such a great community that um, are through Facebook. One just formed today. It, it's like neighbors, not neighbors helping neighbors, but it's basically you can go on a, 
a, a Google or a Doodle and sign up and you can say, you know, I need some help with perishables, non-perishables, and there's a group of Arlington residents that not only are getting donations to cover those costs, but also are delivering them. So um, as long as we all watch out for each other and everybody knows what we need to do to stay healthy and safe, um, uh, do that. And as always, you can contact any member of the board. Um, we'll get you to the right group person um, for any assistance that you need. And we'll get through this. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, our town manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a prepared statement that I'd like to read, but before I do that, I just want to reiterate what you said, that uh, town council has spent a great deal of time today researching legalities around um, town meeting and how we could uh, consider different ways of conducting town meeting and should have a report prepared later this week, uh, if not maybe tomorrow for the board and other committees consideration. I'll also add that I've been talking with uh, my colleagues in other cities and towns or towns in the region who have the same concerns about how to conduct their town meeting, whether it be open or representative. Uh, and with town council's work and talking with them, we're gonna, we're gonna look at every strategy that's possible to make sure that we can still conduct town business and, and get a, a budget passed so that we can operate after July 1st. So uh, thank you for highlighting that and stand by for more, more information. Uh, so again, I'd like to read this statement. This statement is excerpted from a release that just went out in regards to what's been happening in town over the past several days, but I think it's important for those here tonight and those watching on TV uh, to be able to hear about this information. So Public Health Director Natasha Waden, Director of Health and Human Services, uh, Director Christine Bongiorno, Superintendent of Schools Kathleen Bodie, and I met today after an Arlington resident was diagnosed with a presumptive case of COVID-19. Uh, presumptive means that the DPH has tested that patient and it has come back positive, but we're still waiting for confirmation from the CDC. That's why the term presumptive is used. Uh, COVID-19, which is the illness associated with the novel coronavirus. The town was notified today that one of their children, who is a student at the Stratton Elementary School, has also tested positive for COVID-19. The Stratton was closed today, but our health department has today informed all faculty and staff and the families of any students who are considered by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health as being close contacts with the infected student. Those individuals have been advised to self-quarantine for 14 days and not report to school on Tuesday in accordance with the advice of DPH. The Health Department and DPH stress, if you have not been notified by the Arlington Health Department that you need to self-quarantine, then you do not need to self-quarantine. Arlington Public Schools will open and operate normally tomorrow. The Stratton Elementary School will be open tomorrow with the exception of those students and faculty who have been notified by public health officials that they should self-quarantine. I want to urge that all actions that are being undertaken are in accordance with the latest guidelines from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. I'm very proud of the work being undertaken by our leaders. The town and its public health, human services, and public safety officials are well prepared to respond to this situation and officials prepare and train for public health emergencies regularly. Arlington's health officials are still awaiting test results, which involve another Arlington family, family, a member of which also attended the Biogen Conference, whose children attend school at the Dallin Elementary, Gibbs, and Arlington High School. The Arlington Health Department reports that two, the two infected residents, uh, who are the Stratton family, are recovering at home, and that these two families will continue to be monitored and supported by our public health and school officials. I want to highlight this. The town of Arlington has opened a call center this evening, which will be staffed by members of the health department until midnight. Arlington school families may call 781-316-3170 with questions. I want to note that this number is only open to Arlington school families, and our staff cannot provide information to the media or the general public via this hotline. A second sanitization of the Stratton School occurred Monday with crews using cleaning sprays and electrostatic machines, which are particularly effective at mitigating infections and viruses with special attention to commonly touched surfaces and objects. As always, children and adults should be reminded to take everyday precautionary steps to stay healthy, including hand washing, which is always the first line of defense against the spread of germs. So this will be an evolving situation. Uh, we will continue to be working with our public health and public safety officials as well as the state and federal officials uh, in monitoring this as it progresses. We will continue <clears throat> providing updates to both the board and the general public, and we will continue to, to answer questions as they come up from the public. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, <clears throat> I am very uh, pleased that I get to be chair for the first, this first agenda item, um, uh, the 
introduction of the new permanent police chief, um, the best law enforcement uh, person that we had over at the Arlington Police Department who um, has been committed to uh, the Arlington community, residents, businesses, and sometimes people who don't live in Arlington and need services. Um, I'd like to introduce our new police chief, Julianne Flaherty. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. That was wonderful. And thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, first, I would like to thank the town manager for appointing me to this um, role and for having the faith in me to lead the Arlington Police Department. Um, I'd also like to thank the board for the support that you've shown me over the past year. I'm very grateful for that. I know that I've come um, before you a couple of times over this past year to talk about the good work that the women and men of the Arlington Police Department do, and um, I just want to reiterate that uh, I feel very fortunate to lead this department. We have an amazing group of um, passionate um, professional officers who um, who deliver quality services and um, follow through with the mission of the police department and, um, and love working with the community. So I'm very grateful and fortunate to, to lead this department. Um, I've also um, had the great opportunity to work with a lot of the community members over the past year and I look forward to continuing um, developing these great partnerships. So thank you very much for having me here tonight and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <coughs> Okay, once again, thank you. Um, we've worked with you in the past. We'll continue to work with you in the future. Um, I believe you're going to be here for an agenda item later on. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Chief. Um, and then again, um, just a little variation from the um, agenda. Our colleague from the Finance Committee, the, the Chairman, uh, Mr. Tosti, is has his meeting starting shortly, if it hasn't started already, at 7.30. Um, and in the interest of, he's a really important person, um, he needs to get to that meeting. I, with everyone's indulgence, I'm going to um, have his warrant article hearing that he, we need to hear from him, um, Article 25. Um, Mr. Todd. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman, I appreciate it. Um, we're hearing Minuteman tonight. It's gonna be an interesting, uh, interesting hearing. Um, article 25 is the uh, motion um, article to change the dates by which the town meeting, uh, the town manager has to submit the budget uh, to the Board of Selectmen and to the Finance Committee. Uh, finance Committee is, is sort of strongly opposed to this. Uh, in fact, we voted unanimously the other night to uh, a motion of no action. And I'd like to encourage you or urge you to support that motion. Uh, really three reasons. Uh, the Finance Committee, it takes time to, to crank up once the budgets are gotten. So, so the budgets are obtained by most of the Finance Committee. Somebody has to hand deliver them or get them out. That's so, uh, the third week in January. Then people have to set aside time. They study the budgets. Then they have to set aside time to meet with the other person who might be dealing with that particular department. Then they have to set up an appointment with the department head uh, to go through the mechanics of uh, and the numbers in their budget. After that, sometimes they usually meet together to go over it and decide what they're going to present to the full finance committee. And then it goes through the process of presenting these budgets to the finance committee. There's like 40 or 50 different items here, different budgets that have to be submitted to the finance committee. Uh, we usually start our formal sessions in the second week in February, uh, and we're cranking through budgets as much as we can. Uh, we're also at the same time scheduling hearings. Uh, we try to get as much of this done as we can because in March, uh, we hear before the school committee comes, the Minuteman Vogue School comes, the capital budget comes, the uh, uh, Con uh, Community Preservation Act people come. So those usually take like whole nights or at least half nights before it. And then we try to get everything done by the last, uh, in the last week in March, so we're uh, ready to start putting together the finance committee report, which usually takes uh, within the first week or two of April, we then send the Finance Committee report out to uh, a lot of different people, including the manager's office, town council's office, the moderator, uh, to review and make sure that everything's on board, that we've got everything set, and then try to have it ready uh, to send out with the selectmen's report, uh, which, <coughs> and uh, usually wants to get that out at least a week ahead of town meeting. So 
Uh, I think one or two times we've been able to do that. Quite often, we're not able to do it. We have to have them on the seats of town meeting uh, the first night of town meeting. And uh, with the shorter town meetings, that gives people fewer times to do it. So it, it really is a, a long process uh, to get everything done, and I think we need the time. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the governor is sort of the, you know, we try to get an indication all through the fall, meeting with the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, of what the numbers are going to be from the state. Um, and, uh, and so we, sometimes we have at least a sense of what's going to be um, uh, on that. Uh, and then we have the governor's numbers at the end of January, and I realize that this was the issue that started all this. Uh, but that's just the start of it. Um, then the, the Finance Committee usually waits until April 15th, which is the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, when they sit, submit their numbers. Um, and then, you know, we're able to finalize it and try to get it to print and get it out. Uh, then, then the House meets at the end of April. Then the Senate Ways and Means Committee meets in the first two weeks and presents their report in early May. And then this full Senate meets, and then you have conference committee in June, and then the governor gets the budget towards the end of June, even to July. And so we really don't know what the final numbers are going to be someplace in mid-July. We have a pretty good sense of the numbers, uh, but we really don't have that sense. So, I mean, things are going to be changing right along through the process. And the third point I wanted to make is the, the way things have been handled with the Long Range Planning Committee uh, and all the groups uh, working together, the Finance Committee, the Selectman, the Manager, the Superintendent, uh, is that pretty much everybody knows what their budgets are going to be and how much is going to be there. The only um, flexible part is the Override Stabilization Fund. And the Override Stabilization Fund, basically, that's the last thing on the town meeting warrant before we get to resolutions. And that's the one we wait until the end to make some adjustments. So if, if the, uh, uh, the budget from the town manager comes in, governor gives more money, which he did th this year, recommends that more money be given, uh, then we put more money in the override stabilization fund. If for some reason the recommends less money, then we t put less money into the override stabilization fund. Uh, and, and the same thing goes through with the House Ways and Means Committee. So it's not like we have to go back and redo all the budgets. Um, it's just that that fund either gets less money put in or less money t taken out. Uh, that's the variation there. So uh, well, I understand it sort of be nice to he wait and hear from, the, uh, from what the governor has to say. But if, if that's the case, we're practically not going to get those budgets until uh, uh, mid-February. Uh, and, and that's really too late. Now, sometimes our, our sessions are pretty fast. Uh, there's not a lot in the warrant to, to, to really deal with. But sometimes it gets really crowded. Uh, so again, these are the reasons the Finance Committee is asking you to uh, uh, vote no action on this and, uh, you know, we'll do anything to help improve the process, but I think this just puts an extra squeeze. I mean, I got 21 people, most of with, uh, you know, part-time or full-time jobs that, that uh, and we're meeting twice a, twice a week as it goes, Mondays and Wednesdays, all through February and March. Uh, so I think it would put a strain on the committee uh, and I'd appreciate your support on that. So I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, I, I actually have a, a statement. And first of all, I want to apologize to Mr. Toste because he has reached out to me a few times. And I've returned some of the messages, but I, I owed him the last call and we never <laughs> had a meeting. So I apologize for that, Alan. Um, I was the person who added this, or requested that this be added to the warrant. And, and part of the reason that it was added is in asking the town manager would it help him and his staff if he had a little extra time in January to get the report done on top of knowing perhaps what the governor's budget number is? Um, and he said yes. And so I, I would like it at, at this point, again, it's on me that I didn't get back in touch with Adam, but to improve the process, we've heard from the Finance Committee, and I'm, I'm a 25-year member of the Finance Committee, I, I realize that the time constraints. I'd like to have a meeting with the town manager and Mr. Tosti and, and I'd actually like to move to table the vote tonight and report back after that. Not that we'll do anything different, but I feel like we should have a meeting to talk about what the reasons the Finance Committee had, what the reason the town manager and his staff had, and then come back. And I, I'm not saying that I'm going to push forward and, and recommend something later, but I just feel like we, we should have that discussion and then come back. Be happy so if to. that's all right, okay. Be happy to. Second. Table by Mr. DeCourcy. 
Seconded by Mr. Curo. Um, and that's fine, but I anticipate that when this comes back on the agenda that absolutely because there'll be a vote. Each Warren here, uh, <coughs> we're going to be here a long time. Oh yeah, so. yeah, no, 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 okay. no doubt. Um, and, and like I said, that's it's it's on me. We didn't have the discussion, but I think we should have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you have a hand up, Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'll follow up privately. Thank you. Um, Warren article. Anyone else on article 25? If no, actually, there's a motion to table. So, uh, on a motion to table by Mr. DeCourcy. Seconded by Mr. Kiro. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Um, if I could ask Ms. Marr to note that this will appear on our next and last warrant out okay. hearing. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate You're it. Thank you. Okay, now we will go back to our agenda. Uh, first, we have consent agenda. Minutes of Joint Select Board and Arlington Redevelopment Board Meeting 11320. Minutes of Meeting 22420. Request special one day beer and wine license 31420 at the Unitarian Universalist Church, Dance with Dignity, Sherry A. Barron. Request special one day all alcohol license 32420 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for Chamber of Commerce, annual dinner, Beth Locke, Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Request special one day beer and wine license 32420. 720 Robbins Memorial Town Hall for Music and Bloom Fundraiser, Patsy Kramer, Arlington Garden Club. Request special one day beer and wine license 328 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for Beats for Eats Fundraiser. Andy Doan, Arlington Eats, request contractor drain layer license, Porcelli Inc. out of Woburn, Mass. Request contractor drain layer license, Stephen Steve. Stephen Sons Contracting Inc. out of Medford, Mass. Request contracting drain. Drain Layer License, Straight Line Excavation Corps, Tewksbury, Mass. Appointment of new election workers, and thank you to all these people because we really do need you and we keep you busy. Should pay you more. But anyways, appointment of new election workers, Marianne Fitzgerald, 54 Medford Street, number 310, unenrolled, Precinct 10, Doris M. Hutchinson, 28th Esther Street, Democrat, Precinct 14, Karen M. Kramer, 63 Fremont Street, Democrat, P Precinct 3, Marjorie D J. J. Moores, 147 Warren Street, number 2, unenrolled, Precinct 9, James R. Muncy, 215 Mass Avenue, number 25, unenrolled, Precinct 1, Helen Lee Seminowitz, 34 Hamilton Road, number 410, Democrat, Precinct 6, Joyce B. Stewart, 37 Drake Road, number 401, unenrolled, Precinct 20, Lawrence C. Weber, 11 Baker Road, Democrat, Precinct 20, and that is the consent agenda. Can I first have a motion by? Move approval subject all conditions set forth. Secure, Second. seconded by um, Second. Mr. Hurd. Um, is there any, I know um, Ms. Barron contacted us um, yeah. about, um, and I told her that she, she need not be here tonight because she had a conflict. Um, yeah, and uh, Madam Chair, if, if I might, uh, Ms. Barron had sent a statement which I, mm -hmm. I had said I would be happy to read. Thank you. She's unable to be here because of a uh, family illness. Um, this is Sherry Barron, one of the um, organizers of Dance for Dignity. I hope that you will grant the one-day license uh, for our Dance with Dignity on Saturday, March 14th from 7 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. As of now, we are planning to go ahead with the dance but are very mindful of the virus and will act according to public health recommendations. Until three months ago, I did not know that there were immigrant families and individuals needing housing and other help in our community. These folks have fled horrific circumstances, daughters being raped, sons lured into gangs, families unable to find economic support and other devastating situations. Then I became connected to ARCS, Arlington Cambridge Somerville cluster of the Refugee Immigration Ministry, and met new friends to begin to plan the dance, a fundraiser to help these families start a new life here in Arlington. Our immigrant friends need housing, food, clothing, transportation, vocational training, and legal assistance in order to stay on the path to citizenship. Did you know that when immigrants come here, they cannot work for six months? So basically, they are expected to live without earning a living. Can you imagine being in that situation? We hope to raise $25,000 through this fundraiser. I ask you all to dig in and help us in any way you can. I know you are asked to give money all the time. We get lots of mailings every month at our house. We make choices. I think that this cause deserves our response. People have run from terrifying lives in their home countries. They want to live here with us. Thanks to all of you. I hope you will drop in on Saturday night. The band is fantastic and the program will be fascinating and good food. Thank you all very much. much uh, best Sherry Barron. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. 
Um, is there anyone else here for any of these events or other agenda items under consent agenda? Any further questions or comments by my colleagues? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote. We now go to appointments. Um, Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, traditionally, when we have openings for associate members or full members, it's whoever is the chair of the select board at the current time. So um, I was had the opportunity and the, and the privilege to meet with uh, two people, Aaron Ford and, and Stephen Revelak, um, for appointment as associate members to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Their resumes, curriculum vitae, certainly speak to their years of experience. Um, Mr. Ford and his uh, family uh, moved here early in the 2010s, um, have a family here. Um, he's extremely knowledgeable. He's, uh, I think, a principal of a, a structural engineering firm. Um, and really, uh, along with Mr. Revelak, realizes that um, serving on the Zoning Board of Appeals, it's, you know, they're, they're personal failings and there's policy statements, but that doesn't play into their role. They, they certainly have the breadth of knowledge in terms of, you know, looking at what the zoning bylaw and other applicable laws say, applying that to um, what's before them, see if it works, if it doesn't work, if it's the way it can work, or maybe it can't. So I really like that objectivity um, because also there are Arlington residents who care about the town, which is why they're volunteering their time and expertise. So first, if I could, um, I would like to bring up um, Mr. Ford. If you could come to the microphone and just for the record, uh, say your name and any sort of premier 101 or um, sort of the short version of what I got out of you. <laughs> uh, my name is Eric Ford. I'm a you got to speak into the mic, sorry. With LA Peace Partners. We design commercial buildings and we've been a resident since 2013. You got to speak into the mic. Oh, right sorry. in the microphone. Yeah, it, like yeah. That. sorry. It's recording the record. That, that's what they got do. it. And uh, we're excited. I'm excited to be part of this group and on the board and look forward to representing Arlington and um, the zoning board. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Um, and next, Mr. Oh, oh, Mr. Dunn. Sorry, Mr. Ford. You're not, you might not be off the hot seat yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's uh, trying. He's trying. <laughs> Sometimes we ask questions, but I'm not, I, I, don't have, I actually don't have a question, but I'm going to tell you something that I think is really important. Um, and I know Steve has heard, probably heard this speech before, and I, I don't need to, I, I only, which is, so uh, this is the board that's hearing about the Mugar property. And the Mugar property is one of the, uh, and what happens to it is one of the most significant issues about, this effect, it's coming down the pike for the town over the next few years. And uh, we can also ex we can expect that whatever vote happens, and uh, who knows, you may not even be voting on it, but whatever vote happens, it's going to end up in court. It's going to probably going to be court for a long time. And the quality of the decision that's rendered by the ZBA is going to be what decides whether or not we win. And so it is really important that the ZBA feels like it has all the resources and all of the assistance that it needs to render a good and technically correct decision. And I know the town manager knows it, and I know the town council knows it, and I know that they've been working and they've secured a lot of technical assistance, but every zoning board appeals member that comes up, I give the speech to and I say, don't let it don't let it slip and don't say, oh shoot, if we had more, we could fix this. But we've got it. We can make this happen. It's that important. So don't be shy about raising your hand. And thank you for volunteering. Well, it's my pleasure. I understand uh, what's at stake and I think the one thing that I can bring is is um, the ability to interpret the intent of the, the codes and, and what um, the precedent is in order to help guide the town and uh, respond to what's being brought before us. So, um, so I'm excited. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions or comments for Mr. Ford? You're free. You can go back. But we haven't voted for you yet, so you Got should hang. Uh, next, Mr. Revelak. And just name for the record when you... Steve Revelock, 111 Sunnyside Avenue, and someone who is under no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> um, I've been an Arlington resident since 2007. I served on the town zoning recodification working group uh, and have since been a member of the zoning bylaw working group. I have an interest in things like land use and housing and also uh, honestly helping, helping people who you know, are just coming before the ZBA who really don't know what, understand what the process is, who don't have representation and are just trying to you know, do something for their families. 
And um, I see this as a natural pro progression for Steve. Um, when he first moved into the Sunnyside Ave area, a group formed. We, you know, he's certainly gotten well versed on floodplain maps and uh, CSO discharges, which that really doesn't have anything to do with um, the ZBA. But since then, I've seen a natural progression where, as you said, the recodification committee, which one time the previous board of selectmen, it was called, thought they were banishing me to a terrible committee, and I was placed on the town's bylaw recodification committee. And it really does give you a working knowledge because um, you go through everything. And again, I. I appreciate what he's going to bring to the table on that. And he's been on various other committees and commissions. And last year, worked with the Redevelopment Board as sort of our liaison from the Select Board. So uh, I was very excited that he's willing to step up once again and, and, and commit some time. Um, any grilling for Mr. Revelak? No? Is there a motion by? Move approval of uh, both Mr. Ford as, uh, as a uh, member uh, both associate. associate member and uh, Mr. Revelak is an associate member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Is there ex uh, is there a second? Second. <laughs> By Mr. Dunn. I started to say expiration, but that's because these terms, there's no expiration. They usually, if we're lucky, they go on to full member if an opening occurs. Any further questions or comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, second by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous, unanimous vote. Thank you again. You're welcome to stay, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, because our next exciting vote is water, oh, water sewer rate changes to mitigate the MWRA, and I'm going to say it right, Kevin, debt shift. Mr. Greeley always had a problem <laughs> with that word. I'd say C the F in shift. <laughs> Mr. Chapterley. Sorry, I, he's in my <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I think I just, I won't say that word uh, under this agenda item because yeah, I, I right. can't help it. Uh, so this is a, a matter the board's been discussing for quite a while now, uh, over the past couple of years, and then more intensely over the past couple of months. So obviously, as the board recalls, we talked about this at the board's last meeting to get a sense of the board's uh, interest or tolerance for how much of the uh, shift to roll off uh, in this fiscal year and then in succeeding fiscal years. And ultimately, the board had a pretty uh, quick, easy consensus of rolling off about a third of the shift, which wouldn't be the full amount of high school debt that's going to be coming on the tax rate at the end of this year, uh, but would get fairly close to that. So what you have before you tonight is a memo from uh, the Director of Public Works, Mike Rademacher, laying out um, in, in various ways to look at it what the rates would be for all of the tiers for water and sewer in FY21 if adopted, as well as what the percentage increases would be and also what the annual cost increases would be and the quarterly cost increases. Uh, so that's all broken down here on this memo. And I, and I think um, it, pro it probably stands to, to call these out that, so the average annual bill right now for water sewer would be $753. Uh, if these rates were adopted on an annual basis, that would increase to $877. Uh, and on a quarterly basis, the average is $188 right now. If these rates were to be adopted, that would increase to $219 a quarter. Now, um, for those watching, uh, to be very clear, moving this means that tax increases will be mitigated. So the tax increases that were expected based on the high school debt exclusion will be mitigated based on moving this bill because we will be taking just about, uh, just under $2 million off the tax levy. Uh, so though these, uh, admittedly, these, rate, uh, these increases may seem large, the whole idea that the board has been promoting is rebalancing the deck of what's raised on the tax rate versus what's raised on the water rates. Uh, so these, these impacts will not be felt fully because of what's coming or, or what's being mitigated on the tax rate. Uh, I also want to add, there'll be a discussion later tonight about a warrant article for a senior water sewer discount. And I think that's, that, that is a matter that was both related and can be considered separately from this. Um, basically, not to, to take from what town council will say later, uh, to be able to offer a senior water discount as expansive as the senior tax deferral and the senior circuit, tax, uh, senior circuit breaker tax exemption that was passed by town meeting last year, the board will need to, in town meeting, we need to approve the filing of home rule legislation to be able to create a program that reaches the higher income limits like the property tax deferral and the circuit breaker program. However, a smaller, less expansive program can be adopted by July 1st to be able to provide relief uh, to qualifying seniors uh, on July 1st when these rates would start to, uh, people would start to see these rates in their water bills. 
So though I don't um, have a program for you to consider and adopt tonight, I can tell you that we can bring you something um, before the start of town meeting for your consideration. That would be, again, probably less expensive than what I imagine the board wants to do on a long-term basis, uh, and also assure you that the way the budget is currently constructed for FY21, along with these rate increases, we have confidence that we'd be able to absorb whatever type of program uh, the board would put in place. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And um, I just want to say this, uh, I want to commend my colleagues and the manager and others. This sort of came out of um, the first June 2017 election that we had um, for the Gibbs, the Hardy, and Thompson. And, and um, we heard from a lot of people in terms of what their tax bills would look like. And they basically said, you know, this hits and, you know, then the assessment hits. Don't you people look at all this and, you know, stop having it pile all on, on at once? Can you do some future planning? Um, so by the time the June 2019th um, uh, exclusion, high school exclusion and override, which Mr. Dunn chaired, this was pretty much in the final stages so that, as the manager explained, um, nobody's taxes are going to go down even previous to what they were, but we took into account different taxes um, that a resident needs to pay so that as um, one tax is going up, the other tax, because of what the manager cited with the $2 million sort of shift, brings it down. So hopefully you see more like this in your financial commitment in your taxes versus an up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, so uh, it, it, it was something that it, it took a while to do that because it's really hard to forecast. There was always the, a recession is coming, a recession is coming. So we had backup plans for that and continue to do that. So I just want to say to voters out there that say, um, you know, don't you people think about this. Don't hit us with everything all at once. We heard that, and, and that's why this was implemented, for some other reasons also. But um, I, I, just that we, the board and, and the manager and uh, departments do take those concerns very seriously. But did someone have their hand up? Mr. Thank Dun Kiro and then Mr. Dunn, sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank, thank you to the, the manager. Um, I, th I think you summarized it um, pretty well. I just want to add a few, few little pieces here. I mean. One of the reasons we were so insistent on doing this this year, as you noted, that there was some concern, particularly with a lot of our seniors, about the uh, impact of um, increases in taxes. And I think the, the thinking of the board was that by um, shifting over to the um, water and sewer, we achieve a couple of things. One is that with water and sewer rates, uh, you do have some control over your um, usage where you don't have control. Um, uh, when it's uh, shifted over onto the tax rate. That's one. The second is um, the recognition that a lot of, that probably most senior households are um, smaller households as one or maybe two people in general who would be using um, less uh, water and, and uh, sewer. And uh, one thing that should be noted is uh, when the manager, um, you know, talked about the cost average uh, for the home use, what we'd be looking at, that's based on 60 CCFs per year, which is, you know, a higher rate of usage, but we have actually a tiered rate. So if you're using less water, you're actually paying less per CCF. So the, the combined impact of that should serve as some buffer. Um, and lastly, I just want to say thank you to the manager for explaining that. I'm looking forward to hopefully at the next meeting to be able to look through those scenarios um, for at least a short-term uh, relief program, um, you know, many, many cities and towns in the Commonwealth, um, I lost a Saturday I'll never have back, going through the, the cities and towns that have uh, discount programs generally targeted at seniors, sometimes needs-based, often, most of the time needs-based and targeted at, at, um, at seniors. Um, so to allow us to do that on a short-term basis and then have a longer-term program should uh, we recommend in town meeting approve um, the um, uh, warrant article that's before us uh, later on this evening. So uh, I want to thank, thank you for your work on this. Thank you to the DPW and thank you to town council I know has been involved in this as well, the analysis. So thank you. Should I take that as a motion to approve? I move, I move approval. Moved by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Second. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn, did you? Yes. Uh, I'm really happy for us to get this done. This is something I wanted to do the day that I took this seat. And uh, I had to be persuaded for a while why it wasn't the right time. And uh, 
the reasoning was really convincing. It wasn't the right time, in particular, because I think about like six years ago, for other reasons in our dynamic, our water rates were going up a lot, and by doing this change, it would have triggered, um, it, it would have been really difficult for a lot of people. But, uh, and so being able to combine this with the override and being able to say, you know, this is partly how we're paying for the high school, um, I am really glad to get this done. And we should note for everyone that we are not voting on this right now just so Dan can <laughs> get an opportunity to <laughs> right, vote on this. Right, we can do that for the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we can keep voting, woo. Okay, um, any further questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Agenda item 14, discussion, 2025, semi-quincentennial Patriots Day celebration. I'm gonna make you all say that before you leave. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Hard. That one's a little more difficult than debt shift, so <laughs> a little less hairy to get wrong. So I, I talked about this a couple times um, in new business at past meetings, but probably about a month, month and a half ago, I attended a meeting with representatives from the select boards of Concord, um, Lexington, and a few other uh, surrounding cities about the 2025 semi-quincentennial celebration. So it'll be Patriots Day weekend in 2025. They anticipate, so it'll be the, obviously the 250 year celebration. So they had discussed the potential for the then President of the United States to attend. And someone had mentioned, we don't know who the President will be, but we at least know who it won't be in five years from now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Not that, touching it, that one. It, it, it got a couple one. laughs at the meeting, so I figured I'd throw it out there. So, anyways, so we have to. It sounds far away, but we have to submit a plan to the committee and the Department of Interior in the next year. So the recommendation is to create a committee, a town committee, in order to handle this and start getting the, the ball rolling on planning part, on the planning of the events. So it would be this particular weekend in 2025, Easter Sunday is that Sunday. So the events that they're planning are all going to be on Saturday and Monday of, of that Patriots Day weekend. So for whatever steps we need to do to, to get that committee rolling. Okay. Um, I guess I, if I may, um, would assign continue to assign you, Mr. Hurd, uh, yep. working with the town manager perhaps at the next meeting or an April meeting, whenever sure. that it appears as an agenda item, and we have sort of the framework of uh, what the committee, will, it will be a select board committee, yeah, and sense. or if there's anything else that we need to do to structure this committee, because I know as part of this consortium and designating this first step with plans, um, talking to some of our colleagues in, in Lexington, and I think the other gentleman was Bedford, if there's anything else we have to do to structure this committee that qualifies us to apply for grants and be able to receive them if um, we get the approval. But I'm gonna leave that to Mr. Hurd and, oh, Mr. Chaplain. I, I would only ask too, if, if board members have uh, constituencies or people they think should serve on this committee, let me or uh, Mr. Hurd know before the next meeting and we can build that into what we yep. propose to the board. Okay, so if there's anybody out there that would like to perhaps offer suggestions or um, their time um, on the uh, semi-quincentennial Patriots Day celebration for year 2025, please direct those to the select board office. Um, and Mr. Hurd and Mr. Chapdelaine will receive those and do what they will. It's just a five-year commitment, right? <laughs> just a five-year commitment. <laughs> Yes, so. Wait a minute, should I do that? No, <laughs> um, I don't think, do we need a vote or move or sit? Nope, okay. Um, we will now go on to, everyone get their calendars out, and we're gonna be a little creative with this. We need to set April 2020 select board meetings. We ha automatically have, and I think we posted the meeting for Monday the 6th, because it's an organizational meeting, but it also will be, um, roll into a regular business meeting. Um, but uh, looking at it, um, of course, we start meeting on the 27th for town meeting, but that's usually a very abbreviated agenda. Um, so uh, considering everything we have to do, as well as the um, holy days, the holiday in the holidays, um, I would put forth to my colleagues the 6th and maybe 15th, or do you want to meet I'm trying to, or, or something else. Or do you want to meet 6 and 13? I'm just afraid if we meet on 6 and 13 doesn't have much. And so what is the will of my colleagues? 
Yeah, yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, and I, I didn't realize the six was already posted, just so my colleagues know. I, I'm not available the night of the, the sixth, and I don't know if it's already posted. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, if it isn't, um, if there's any way to do the eighth and the 15th, but I, I, I'll just defer to the other members on that. Well, under law, we have to, since there's an election and there will be different people in the chairs, uh, we have to have a organization. Mrs. Organization. The, yeah. the eighth yeah. is Passover. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then, uh, Mr. Kiro? No, that's what I was going to say. Uh, even though the calendar reflects the first day of Passover, it actually begins the evening before. Mm -hmm. How do people <clears throat> feel? I mean, we definitely need to meet the 6th. Um, we could, but, but again, it, it's vacation week, but the 22nd, which is a Wednesday. Is there any night that week? Of course, we can't do Patriots Day. I'm trying to do it so we can get the business, you know, if we can space it out with, with at least a week apart, but... Mr. Carroll. Do we only need an organizational meeting that, on the 6th? Is that all we need? And then we can. Yeah. That's what all you we can need do is, is if we can do meeting. an organizational meeting on the 6th. I, I believe under the law, as long as we have a majority, we don't need yeah. all five members. And then we have the regular business meeting on the 8th. But, my, but then my next question is I'm not, we've never done it in my time on the board. I don't know if we accepted the provisions to allow for remote participation or even if Mr. DeCourcy is available for remote participation. For the organization yeah. meeting, I, I, I'm available. I don't know if it's something that uh, Attorney Heim. Is, is, so I believe that we have accepted remote participation in Arlington. So um, I can certainly look into. It's on a board by right. board basis, I believe. Though I think the, yeah. the the difficulty. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, may I? Yeah. I think the difficulty is making sure that um, the remote participant can be heard and that everyone can hear them. Um, so we'll have to just sort of double check to make sure that we have technology available in this room that can meet those requirements. And if not, um, we could always perhaps go to a part of town hall, the manager's conference room, have that first part of that meeting there that has a telecommunication system that might yeah. be yeah. satisfactory if we can't get it up here. I don't want to spend you know, a lot. Okay. If ultimately we do that in the matter of course, then we'll look into it and spend the money. But And then we, after that vote, um, I'm anticipating what I'm hearing is um, we, we did adjourn uh, the organizational meeting and the select board meeting, and are we saying to meet on the 8th? Madam Chair, now that it's my business, but when do you need to go to print? For the warrant? For a select, the select, select board report. report. Do we know that? Um, we like to get it out as early as possible, so it's just dependent on once we have final votes and comments, when we need to get it. We usually print it ourselves. We don't usually send it to the printer. So we have a little leeway. Did you want to? It's just if you, depending upon whether you want to get it out a week or two weeks before town meeting and mailing and stuffing time. That was my only thought. Oh, okay. All right, so how, first let's get this part. Sorry, I'm stumbling here. That we have the organizational meeting on the 6th. Can people do the regular business meeting that week on the 8th? No, well, that's the first Passover. evening Passover. Oh, you said that. Um, well, you know, why don't we just keep the 6th as a regular meeting? Because, um, you know, because we definitely need that, and I don't see any other night that really works. Um, and then, what, what say you, uh, Mr. Chapterling? I mean, what if we hold the 13th as a, if necessary date, if there's business that needs to be done before town meeting on the 13th? But if it's not necessary, the board wouldn't have to meet and then could meet again on the 27th on the first night of town meeting for any business the board needs to attend to before the start of town meeting. Someone's watching Bugs Bunny. I don't know. Mm. Um, okay, so, Sense, I, 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 so we'll do the 6th and the 13th, but just knowing from the select board office, there may have to... Um, if there's something that we need to do before town meeting the 27th, I'm going to leave it to the future chair for him or her, her or him to, um, if there's a need for a meeting in that third week, to oversee that. So we're okay with those dates? Great. Uh, now we go to warrant article hearings, articles for review, article 13, bylaw amendment, fossil fuel infrastructure. I just need to pull up my warrant article, sorry. This is when I miss the paper stuff, I'd have a tab on it. Okay, I'm going to call it Town Council comments. 
Excuse okay. me, Madam Chair. Yes. Yeah, uh, it, it, we're starting with Article 13. I, I'm going to recuse myself from that discussion as I do the legal work for, for National Grid, so I, I'm going to step out for, mm -hmm. for this portion. Okay. Um, this was inserted by the Select Board <clears throat> at the request of the Clean Energy Future Committee. Do we, Mr. Chapterling? I'll, I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, so I just want to say that, uh, as you just mentioned, this has been worked on for some time now by the Clean Energy Future Committee. <coughs> uh, this committee started talking about uh, this measure after Brookline adopted the, uh, a very similar measure in December at a special town meeting. Uh, this is something that we were already beginning to look at as part of our net zero planning. Uh, I think, as the board knows, the Clean Energy Future Committee is working on a net zero plan by 2050, looking at a whole long list of measures in the heating and cooling sector, transportation sector, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this would have been a measure we would have likely looked at somewhere along the way in that plan. But given Brookline's action and a lot of community interest in Arlington's pursuit of a similar action, uh, the Clean Energy Future Committee voted to move this forward. So I'm going to ask uh, at the board's, uh, at the chair's uh, discretion for Ken Pruitt, the town's energy manager, to give a little bit of more detailed info and then turn it over to members of the community for a detailed presentation on the proposed measure. Just name for the record. Sir. Yeah, good evening. My name is Ken Pruitt. I'm the town's energy manager. Good to be here tonight. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of background in terms of how we got to where we are. It should take about two, maybe three minutes to do that. Um, you know, Arlington has a long history of leadership on sustainability and no less so in the area of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and carbon pollution. You know, we, in, in 2005, the town uh, adopted a sustainability action plan that, among other things, called for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. by 2020. Um, in 2010, Arlington became a green community. Uh, one of the things that we had to do uh, to become a green community is adopt the, the, the building stretch code. Uh, in 2012, uh, Arlington ran a very successful Solarize campaign that was more successful in signing up um, residents for solar installations than any other community in the state that year. Uh, in 2015, we installed solar panels on six of the school roofs that are generating a tremendous amount of renewable electricity. And um, so what we're talking about tonight is really sort of the logical, a logical next step in that progression. Uh, in 2018, uh, the select board voted to commit Arlington to becoming carbon neutral by 2050. It was one of the requirements of joining the Metropolitan Mayor's uh, Coalition. In July of, the same of that same year, your uh, board created the Clean Energy Future Committee that was tasked with writing a net zero by 2050 plan. Uh, in 2019, uh, Arlington, so last year, we ran the most successful heat smart campaign that has been run in the state to date, signing up um, uh, over 135 Arlington residents for either air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps. There were a couple of other technologies, but uh, air source heat pumps was by far the largest. Um, and several of those homes were all electric. They had, they retrofitted entirely to air source heat pumps, had no backup fossil fuel heating. Um, as the town manager men mentioned on January, January 29th, the CEFC voted unanimously uh, to support this ward article for a um, fossil fuel bylaw. And that vote is consistent also, as the town manager mentioned, with the building electrification measures that are under consideration for the net zero plan. Since that January 29th vote, um, a working group of representatives from the CEFC, from Sustainable Arlington, Mothers Out Front, have been working on the text of the bylaw, trying to determine exactly what it should say. Uh, it's largely initially modeled after the, the bylaw that successfully passed in Brookline, 211 to 3, I believe. But with we are making some changes that we feel are appropriate. Um, we have made some in the draft that we feel are appropriate for Arlington. Um, the Department of Planning and Community Development has been working very closely with this bylaw working group uh, to conduct research to solicit um, community feedback and, and also to help draft um, the Warren article. And then advocates from Sustainable Arlington and Mothers Out Front have been running a townwide uh, advocacy campaign that they plan to continue running right up to the town meeting vote. I do want to introduce um, Amos Meeks, who's co-chair of Sustainable Arlington, to show you a PowerPoint presentation on the bylaw itself um, before he stands up. Uh, however, do you have any questions, any further questions for me? 
No, we'll keep going. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. I know how he feels. I'm a court reporter, and whenever I go to a depot that wasn't scheduled and I walk in, everyone's watching to see the equipment set up. <laughs> Take your time, please. <clears throat> I admire his confidence that it's going to mm -hmm. just work. Look at that. Good job. Well. Wow. <clears throat> just name for the record. And Hello. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, my name is Amos Meeks. Um, I live at 25 Lee Terrace in East Arlington. Um, I am the co-chair of Sustainable Arlington, um, and I'm on sort of the steering committee for um, this group called Clean Heat for Arlington um, that was put together to sort of support this warrant article. Um, so just to start with some of the, um, whoops. Just to start with some of the motivation, um, climate change is happening and it's already affecting Arlington. Um, I'm just showing here quickly uh, annual average temperature observations at the Blue Hill Observatory, so pretty close to here. Um, and as you can see, we've already sort of warmed um, from pre-industrial times by about two degrees C, um, which is actually more, the, the world as a whole has warmed by about one degree C, so we're actually warming uh, faster here. Um, and what that means sort of concretely for Arlington um, among other things are sort of the increased effects of the heat island effect. Um, we get hotter temperatures in the summer, um, which are concentrated in urban areas. Um, you know, we've had some pretty hot summers recently, um, and this has a whole bunch of adverse health effects um, on numerous residents. Um, and we also, climate change um, gives us more extreme storms, so more flooding, uh, more extreme snowfall, um, you know, there have been um, tornadoes and microbursts in, our, in, in Massachusetts. Um, so this is happening now, and it's only going to be getting worse. Um, fortunately, um, as a state and as a community, we've sort of made pretty strong commitments to try and deal with this. So in 2008, um, the state legislature passed the Global Warming Solution Act, um, which committed um, the state to reducing emissions by 80% by 2050. Um, so this sort of graph on the side here just kind of summarizes what that looks like. So in 2016, um, the biggest chunk of our emissions were transportation, um, and then the second biggest were heating and um, electric. Um, and so if you see the 2050, 2050 level, um, sort of an estimate of what or where our emissions might be coming from there, um, the whole heating and transportation section, which takes up you know, more than, well more than half of our 2016 emissions, has to be um, less than half, maybe a third, and overall vastly reduced by um, 2050. And you know, that heating, that's primarily building, building heating, space heating, the sort of things we're talking about. Um, so there's really just, there's no way to meet those, um, those legally mandated emissions requirements that includes using fossil fuels um, for building heating on a large scale. Um, but in Arlington, this is sort of even more stark. Um, so in 2018, as Ken mentioned, the select board voted to um, commit us to the goal of net zero by 2050. And in Arlington, um, emissions related to buildings are actually commercial and residential buildings are about 60% of the town's total emissions. Um, the, with most of the rest being transportation. So again, in order to reach this net zero goal by 2050, we have to reduce this um, as close to nothing as we can get. Um, and again, of these building emissions, um, space heating and water heating are the vast majority of them. Um, so what the picture that this is sort of painting is that, um, you know, we're, we're kind of deep in the hole. We've built a lot of infrastructure that has a long lifetime um, that, you know, burns fossil fuels, and we need to start um, getting, out of that uh, getting out of that hole and getting towards um, these net zero targets. Um, but as the saying goes, when you're in a hole, the first thing you want to do is stop digging. And so that's what this article is really about. Um, we want to stop digging. We want to stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure in new construction and gut renovations. Um, so the focus here really is on what is sort of the most practical, most immediate um, step that we can be taking now, um, which is to stop making this problem worse so that we can start trying to get out of this hole that we're in. So the key thing here is that um, existing buildings are entirely unaffected. 
um, unless they're undergoing a gut renovation, which is construction that's essentially equivalent to new construction. Um, you know, things that most people would consider to be major renovations, like kitchen renovations, bathroom renovations, um, even additions, those are all entirely unaffected. We're just talking about new construction and gut renovations. Um, the planning department has estimated that this would affect a total, uh, a maximum of 70 buildings average per year. Um, so this is about 0.5% or less of Arlington's total housing stock every year. So the, the annual effect is, is really um, relatively small. It's not nearly enough for what we want to do. Um, but, you know, hopefully at least we stop digging, can put down the shovel, and then can start making our way out of this hole. Um, so, but, you know, even though focusing on new, con new construction, our focus here is really on something that's practical and economical. And so we've included a number of um, exemptions uh, towards this goal. So the first one is this affects the customer side only. This has, this does not affect the utilities, does not affect the right of way. Um, all gas cooking appliances are exempted. Um, this is especially important for restaurants where there aren't really non-gas alternatives. Um, backup generators are exempted. Um, portable uh, fossil fuel appliances like a grill, um, totally unaffected. This only affects fossil fuel piping, so real infrastructure that's being put into place. Um, hot water for large buildings are exempted. This is largely um, sort of a technical reason. Um, current products that exist for central hot water for large buildings um, are quite expensive and sort of limited here. Um, economic uh, alternatives for central hot water in large buildings do exist elsewhere in the world and are likely to get here eventually. Um, but currently at this point in time, they're not economical, so there is an exemption. Um, research and medical facilities are exempted. They have higher needs for sort of air turnover and heating, that sort of thing. Um, repair of existing and unsafe piping is exempted. Again, common sense. Um, and while the bylaw does, uh, only affects fossil fuel piping, we make it very clear that um, extension or modification of the non-fossil fuel side, so if you, you know, the water or steam um, systems of a heating system or hot air ducted systems, um, those are unaffected. This only affects the uh, pipe going in. So if you did have a gut renovation with an existing system or, and you know, you wanted to extend that out to an addition and keep the existing system, you can do that as long as you don't need to add or move any fossil fuel piping. Um, and then, even though, even with this set of exemptions, we can't foresee everything, um, so we build in a waiver process to handle any sort of unforeseen issues. Um, so if there is an un undue expense or a practical obstacle, um, someone can uh, seek a waiver. Um, and this would be sort of managed by the building inspector who would be sort of um, on the ground enforcing this bylaw, but the building inspector would be able to get um, support from other town staff and um, outside experts as needed. Um, so we've hoped to, to sort of cover all of the exemptions here, but really the reason why this, this bylaw is practical and economical is that economical um, and practical uh, alternatives to fossil fuel heating exist. Um, these exist in the form of heat pumps. Um, so heat pumps, um, primarily air source heat pumps, which uh, you can sort of see some examples of on the side there, um, they look pretty similar to a standard AC unit, and in fact, the technology is quite similar to a standard AC unit, only they provide heating as well as cooling. Um, but also ground source heat pumps in which you're actually digging a physical well or trench uh, to help to get heat from the ground. Um, and then heat pumps also exist for um, water heating. Um, and so a lot of people when they hear electric heating, they think of sort of old resistance-based electric heating that's very different from a heat pump. Um, heat pumps are extremely efficient. They're um, air source 200 to 300% efficient, ground source um, 300 to 500 plus percent efficient, sort of annual you know, heating season average, that's not like their peak efficiency, that's average over the heating se season, versus electric resistance is very expensive and only about 100% um, efficient. And uh, heat pumps work in our climates. Um, so the NEEP, the um, New England, uh, or the Northeast um, Energy Efficiency Partnership, um, you know, studies heat pumps in the Northeast region um, and they keep a list of sort of cold climate, they, they define cold climate air source heat pumps, um, which mean that they can be efficient um, down to five degrees C and can work down to negative 13, or sorry, five degrees F and work down to negative 13 degrees F, um, which is frankly colder than it ever gets around here really. Um, and then, you know, these can be used also as the sole, so sole source of heating. Um, about 10% of new homes in Massachusetts use uh, heat pumps as the only source of heating. Um, and then we had our recent Heat Smart program where um, over 100 people installed heat pumps and many of those had that as the sole source of heat, no backup heat. So this really works um, in our climate in, Mass in Massachusetts, in Arlington. Um, and 
in some cases, there, there are additional costs, but these are really quite uh, minimal. So this particular study looked at the cost of new construction, comparing a traditional gas and, and electric AC to an all-electric um, heat pump and electric hot water heater. And they found that the installation costs, um, the cost difference was less than $1,000, and the operating cost difference was about $40 per month. Um, and I think it's important to put those in context. Um, so if you look at the, um, you know, for a new 3,000 3, square foot home in Arlington, this is selling for well over a million dollars. So that additional uh, roughly $1,000 of installation cost is um, not, partic not, not very noticeable among that. It's less than a percent, well less than a percent. Um, and then for that same ho home, the monthly costs in terms of um, mortgage, taxes, that sort of thing, um, are over $6,000. Um, so the $40 per month increase, again, is a fraction of a percent um, increase there. But of course, not everyone can, can afford any increase to their expenses at all. Um, but it turns out that affordable housing is already leading the way on electrification. Um, so these are two existing um, and in-process projects, one in Cambridge, one in Brookline, both use um, entirely uh, heat pump heating. Um, and this is a trend throughout Massachusetts um, in general for larger multifamily buildings. Um, heat pump heating is generally the lowest cost or one of the lowest cost options. Um, and in fact, all of, uh, all of the Housing Corporation of Arlington's currently planned pro projects are planning to use um, heat pump heating. Um, so just going back to the point of this, um, electrification is really the only way to reach net zero, um, but we do also get immediate emissions benefits even with a lot of our electricity being produced with natural gas. Um, so the graph here shows, compares sort of emissions, relative emissions of gas compared to a heat pump with the current grid, um, but then a net zero grid, um, which we hope to achieve by 2050 or so, um, emissions from the heat pump are basically zero, while emissions from gas don't change, and that's really what we're driving towards. Um, but even in the current day, a heat pump being installed now saves about 49 tons of CO2 um, over its lifetime compared to a new gas system. So there really are um, substantial and immediate benefits to doing this. Um, our group, Clean Heat for Arlington, um, as well as working with the Town and the Clean Energy Future Committee, have um, been working on extensive and, and ongoing outreach. Um, we recently had a 60 to 70 person public meeting. Um, we've done electronic outreach through um, email lists and uh, social media. Um, we've met with multifamily, commercial, and residential developers and property owners. We've met with Arlington realtors, Arlington architects, um, HCA staff, members of the Chamber of Commerce, and we've um, put together a robust system and have contacted um, a majority of town meeting members um, already at this point. Um, so just to quickly summarize, um, this is sort of necessary if we want to reach these goals. It's practical now because of heat pumps, <coughs> and it's quite economically um, feasible. So um, before we go to questions, I want to sort of quickly introduce a couple of um, people we have in the audience to help answer questions, some outside, um, some people from the town and outside experts. Um, Corley Cooper, a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee. Um, Jeremy Koo, um, who is a consultant that worked with us on our Heat Smart uh, project. Um, Karen Kelleher, um, who works for uh, LISC Boston on affordable housing, and um, Kathleen Scanlon, who is an architect. Um, so they'll come up, briefly introduce ourselves, uh, introduce themselves, and then we'd love to sort of answer all of your questions. Hello, I'm Coralie Cooper, and I'm a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to express support for this warrant article. And um, if I can just jump in. We, do, uh, we don't want all of our supporters kind of coming up and as a steady stream, so if we can just take a moment and people in the audience who support this, if you can just <coughs> raise your hand, because um, we have a fair number of people that we've brought. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Jeremy Koo with the Cadmus Group. Uh, we're an inter international energy consulting firm. Uh, my colleagues and I have worked uh, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and its uh, State Clean Energy Center and Department of Energy Resources, as well as uh, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority and the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources on studying uh, heat pumps and their role uh, in helping these states in achieving their climate targets. So I was invited here by Ken uh, and Amos uh, as just an external expert, uh, both um, continuing my previous capacity, so serving as a technical expert for the Heat Smart Arlington Winchester program, uh, and to answer any technical questions that uh, you may have. 
Hi, I'm Karen Kelleher. I'm a town meeting member. I'm also a member of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, and I'm the executive director of LISC Boston. Um, we are deep affordable housing advocates and um, uh, financi financiers, if you will. We provide support to organizations like Housing Corporation of Arlington and others who are creating affordable housing throughout the Commonwealth, but we also work at the intersection of affordable housing and greening um, multifamily buildings and have developed uh, significant expertise there. I'm not personally a building science expert, but we've looked closely at these kinds of ordinances to determine whether they might have an impact on housing affordability and have uh, concluded, we have sort of the um, dummy's guide to thinking about it uh, for drafting recommendations. You have this with some correspondence with sort of like red light, green light, um, but I can really just support what the presentation provided that these bans with the kind of exemptions that are included should not dramatically increase the cost of housing, affordable housing or otherwise. Um, and that if we would like to move forward with um, heating uh, hot water in multifamily buildings, then we'll need additional subsidy, but it would be great if we want to move in that direction and get to the goals that we've set as a town for us to advocate for additional resources to subsidize that cost and push the industry to develop the, the technology that we need. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Scanlon. I'm a lead accredited uh, registered architect, and I live and work in Brookline. I'm a town meeting member, and I was a co-petitioner on the prohibition for new fossil fuel infrastructure in major construction, which is very similar to the bylaw before you. Um, when we started the process, it seemed very controversial, and as we explained it and people got acclimated to what we were really um, asking for, um, it became very non-controversial. It ended up passing on the floor of our town meeting with a 211 to 3 vote. And um, it's because it became very clear to the community that the intent of the bylaw, similar to yours, was to make it something that worked for everyone in your town, and that the goal was to make the bylaw as practical as possible for residents, staff, and business owners. And the intent of our bylaw, like yours, was to capture new construction, but also major renovations. And that's very important because um, when you're replacing heating systems in very old housing stock. And this is so important in New England. And a gut renovation is the time when it's equivalent to new construction, um, when there's virtually no added cost to implementing these systems. And it truly is catching the low-hanging fruit on your way to achieving your climate goals. So that's all we had to start. We'd be happy to answer questions or um, open it up for any questions. Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you very much. I, I am going to want to hear if there are any, if there's anyone else to testify. But um, first of all, I really want to uh, commend the the groups that have been working um, on this. I I, um, I have met with I think two members of the committee at various times who we've uh, walked through some of the um, issues around this. Um, and I did have the opportunity to attend the Information Center in the Lions uh, room. And I have to say, I've gone to a lot of, I've gone to a lot of information sessions over the years. And this, this was one of the, the best organized and informative ones that I, I think that I, I've, um, I've seen. And I'll admit, I walked in with a lot of questions. I didn't have a lot left when I walked, walked out of there. Um, so I, you know, I have a way of looking at this. I, um, my home was built in uh, 1927, and um, when we moved in, we went downstairs, and it was clear that the boiler had originally been a coal boiler. You could see where the hatch had been welded shut, and we actually still have the, uh, the poker to, to poke, poke the, uh, the coals with. It had then been converted to an oil um, burner. Um, and then we subsequently took advantage of, of um, the programs through, through um, National Grid or whatever it was back in Boston Gas or whatever it was at the time to, to go to natural gas. And it just seems to me that there's been a natural progression like this throughout time. So this isn't that radical to be talking about changing our, our um, source of, of, of heating. Um, and I think that the environmental benefits that you've outlined make it particularly urgent. I also look at, um, when we discussed this, kind of the success of the Solarize uh, Mass Initiative that um, Mr. Pruitt talked about. And we started with um, a, a campaign with support from the town to get people to 
install personal solar. At that time, I didn't take advantage of it. I looked at it, um, but I was told that I would have to cut down the big tree in my front yard, and I don't cut down all trees, so. <laughs> um, so we, did, we didn't take advantage of it at that time. But what I think we've seen throughout town is that even though there was a great participation then, that when all of those panels went up, it in turn created kind of a social norm. A lot more people started taking advantage of it. Social norm has led to a market, has led to greater efficiencies, has led to a drop in the costs, um, which is great, which means that later on I did take advantage of a, my, myself, my family, take advantage of a solar program because I could do it. I didn't have to worry about that tree, that the panels were more efficient. Um, and the work that we did with um, Sustainable Arlington, Mothers, Mothers Out Front, and, and, and others on the uh, community choice aggregation by covering the, the extra balance there with 100% uh, green renewable, local green renewable. Um, energy, it's carbon, carbon free. It's carbon free, which means what you've presented here for a lot of people, if, if they go that way, coupling it with the CCA, it's actually carbon free if they go um, with the, with the, the um, heat, heat pumps. Um, so I'm pretty enthusiastic about it. I mean, I'm pretty confident that the market is going to shift, but sometimes it takes actions like this to nudge it just a little bit. Um, that said, I do have a couple of questions, even though I've gone through this se several times. Um, two specific questions. The first is you talked about on-site fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, everything seems to concentrate on piping. Um, I don't see any reference in there to um, <clears throat> heating oil tanks. Now, I know that most people don't have them installed anymore, but. Look what's happening right now, even this week, and oil prices plummeting. You could see a scenario where people might be tempted. So um, I'm just wondering why uh, fossil fuel infrastructure only concentrated on piping and didn't include um, oil supply tanks. Um, my understanding, and maybe one of the other people could comment on that, is that um, <clears throat> you have a tank, but you will still have a pipe from that tank um, to your boiler or otherwise. And so that pipe however short, would still be prohibited, um, effectively prohibiting um, oil. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And the other question that I have has to do with the, yeah. the definition of major renovation. And this is just for my clarification. I'm looking, there are two clauses here. Um, it looks like they're, okay, I see. One, one is referencing the residential code and one is referencing the commercial code. So you're, you're looking at more than 75% to define a major renovation of the gross floor area for residential, this is a higher bar before you kick it in, but 50% for commercial, I'm reading that correctly? Yes, so um, a couple of points of clarification. So the residential code actually applies to anything more than two stories as well, so a triple okay. decker falls under the residential code. Okay. And that 50% threshold is um, actually built in, it's a, it's a level three or a class three renovation, it's built into that commercial code. Um, so it's an already existing definition that we're sort of um, levering it. And that's, that's a threshold at which they already need to sort of um, update the building to code and that sort of thing. Um, on the residential side, uh, we currently have it at 75%. We're still trying to um, determine whether or not that's the right threshold. We, cause be, um, you know, we've spoken to some um, architects and builders who say at 75%, that actually would not catch a lot of still what would be considered a gut rehabilitation. Okay. Um, but we do want to make sure that we're not, you know, catching something that um, is not a gut rehabilitation is, you know, someone's just sort of project that they're going to be um, doing at home and not sort of redoing the whole house. So that 75% mark, um, we still might change a little bit before a town meeting. Um, but um, that's sort of the, the thinking behind those. Um, from the architect's perspective, when you say a level three renovation, they know what 50%, it's a very commonly understood term when you're applying for a building permit. Mm -hmm. It would be easy for a building inspector to make that determination because it's language they're commonly using already. And to clarify, that does not exist though in the residential code, um, which is why there's not something already there for us to, uh, to work off of. Okay. And the last thing, I know, I, I think I know this, but I think I should, we should surface it here for our colleagues. I know from 
talking to Mr. Hanlon and others, that there is still an open question about what the um, appeals process would, would, would look like. Um, I know my first reaction on reading the proposal was that you know, Brookline created the Sustainable st Review Board, <coughs> and um, you know we, we're, we always have kind of this this balance we're trying to do. There's been this push to not not create so many committees, a plethora of committees, and try to try to um, vest responsibilities with existing entities if possible. <clears throat> Sometimes that's not possible. So I, I see that there's placeholder here um, to potentially activate the Board of Building Appeals, which is on our books but is not currently activated or, or filled with any appointees. Um, and um, I just wanted to flag that. Is that, that still the, the preferred course? Uh. Pat's sort of the, the legal expert, expert on this side of things, so. Um. I'm Pat Hanlon, I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 5. Um, yes, the, right now I think it's true that the preferred way of dealing with appeals is to go through the Building Board of Appeals. Um, it is sort of a logical structure, it's, it's what they're equipped to do. The alternative would be to have the appeal go to the town manager. Uh, and that has, it's quicker and it doesn't have as many people involved, but uh, it's really an alternative in case, we, in case this board or town meeting wanted to go in that direction. The preferred alternative is, is the one that you, is the one that you mentioned. Okay. There's a similar issue with respect to uh, wa waivers uh, where the appeal might go to the town manager as well and not to the building board of appeal. Waivers involve very different considerations from appeals. Appeals are like, are you actually a multi-story building? Do you have 10,000 square feet of yeah. that sort of thing, which is sort of easily dealt with by, by an organization like the Building Board of Appeals. Dealing with special circumstances that are, involve economic analysis, not so much. And there the idea is to basically have a simplified matter and then to develop guidance over time as uh, to make, to make the waiver process as predictable as possible. Great, thank you very much. And I think we should, it's, it's, it's worth clarifying for folks who are following that the Board of Building Appeals is not the Zoning Board of Appeals. It is a separate board that's outlined in the statutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Hurd. Yep, so just a couple comments and then one question. So I have to admit, when I first saw this, I was a little weary about the proposed article, not because I don't agree with the intent, but I just wasn't quite, at the time when I read it, aware of what the alternatives were. So I had just recently gone through a renovation in my house where we added a second floor, and so I wrote, reached out to my HVAC technician, and it turns out the system that we installed would be allowable as an air heat pump source. And the system that we use is amazing. And you know we have it now on our second floor, we have our old steam on the first floor, and we spend most of our time on the second floor because that system is just so much more efficient, so much more comfortable. And when I spoke with him, he said that you know they're <coughs> installing these types of systems everywhere, residential, commercial, large buildings. And these are really the wave of the future, the systems that actually comply with this law that will be left over for the new construction. And you know, he did mention that, and you mentioned that some of the equipment costs up front are a little more, but he said the installation costs are cheaper. And he, I mean, you had mentioned $40 a month. It was his, his uh, opinion that there, it actually runs a little bit more efficiently and cost effective than some of the other alternatives. So with that, you know, just in doing research, I think that, you know, there is uh, people that are doing new construction or major renovations are left with viable options that can provide the cost-effective heat and, you know, can actually provide a better source of heat. And we're now in the process of looking <coughs> to put this type of heating system in our whole house because it just works out so much better for us. So, you know, I, you know, I've turned. I think this is time. I, I think we're, the town's ready for this. Um, so one question on the renovations. So under this bylaw, hypothetically, if someone had, say, a new boiler and they had existing fossil fuel piping in their house and they gutted their house 
and they left all their heating systems in place, could they technically just leave those pipes there? Yes. And so, so they wouldn't be subject to you know, this bylaw because they, they're not putting in new infrastructure. Yes. And at that time, if while the house is open, if they saw portions of the existing piping that was in need of repair, they could make the repairs in order to make sure that piping safe before they close it up. Yep. Okay. That's all. Yeah, I mean, that was an excellent presentation. I did have a number of questions before, but I think just about all my questions are, are uh, have been covered. So I, you know, I think, I think the town's ready for this. I'll wait till after. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I just have a question. Um, it's, it's sort of an offshoot. Uh, when you were going through uh, the presentation and, and looking at comparison of utility costs, um, one of the benefits that really sort of mitigated it even more in terms of utility costs was um, in concert with having solar panels. My question would be um, for the residences and or other buildings that this would apply to where, I guess it's a twofold question, where solar panels weren't an option because I've heard that in the past or have solar panels. So, so my thing, if, if you're in that case in point, you can't do solar panels. Is there another remedy to that? Or are you going to tell me that in the past, sometimes it works, you could put in solar panels, sometimes you can't, but now there's another option. So what I'm saying is to someone who puts it in and says, you know, if I was able to put in solar panels, um, my utility costs would go lower. Do you get my question? You're asking if, if you can't put in solar panels, is there some other sort of alternative to ameliorate the cost? Yes. Um, my understanding is um, no. There is um, a, an area that I'm not super familiar with, which is community solar, where you basically, you know, rather than buying solar panels to put on your house, you're buying into a solar installation elsewhere, and that can actually um, pro basically provide you lower cost electricity. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the current status of that is within sort of state law and, and, and economics, um, but that's what people generally tout as sort of a, a viable alternative for those who can't put solar panels um, on their home. But um, otherwise, sort of our main point is that even without the solar panels, the cost, the increased cost is um, fairly negligible to someone who's buying a new million dollar home. Okay, and, and um, I guess I would say, you know, we're talking about residences and in businesses, um, the town in, you know, adopting the net zero 2050 in terms of basically becoming carbon neutral, um, we're going through, and the manager could, can either correct me or expand upon this, as we go through our new buildings, our high school with sustain, sustainable Arlington others to try to make sure we have energy efficient buildings and we take um, advantage of all the renewable en energy alternatives. Um, and we also recognize that this is one step of um, net zero uh, 2050. There's other steps, especially around uh, transportation, which isn't germane to this, but sort of runs parallel and concert to it. And the town has been implementing that in terms of looking at transportation and reducing emissions, looking at electric and hybrid vehicles with EV charging stations. And we've also uh, looked at um, increasing opportunities in areas uh, in terms of alternative modes of transportation, biking, walking. Um, and so we're doing the same thing in concert with everything that's being done here because um, everybody has to do something. Um, and, you know, 2050 is a, a date, um, but I really think that Arlington, along with other communities, Brookline, we're going to be in the forefront of this, and um, I think we're going to get a, a lot more done by 2050. Um, so I put that challenge out to other municipalities. I know I can't t tackle big businesses and BP and Shell and all that. That's a whole other thing. But um, if not... Um, and this is a Warren article hearing. Anyone here to speak to this that has been said? If not, is there a motion by my colleagues to? I'm, oh, oh, oh yes, Mr. Dunn, I'm sorry. Right, it's, it's fine. I'm, uh, um, so uh, I, I mean, I'll make I'll, I'll get two for one, and I'll move uh, that we recommend positive action on uh, this article. Moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Carroll. Uh, so just and. Uh, um, 
I, and so I guess one thing that I wanted to call out that I think is, at least it's a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's relevant, is that uh, what this is not is, a, ch is a, a change to the building code or a change to our building bylaws, which is why uh, we're not doing things like uh, like referring appeals to like the Zoning Board of Appeals or the ARB or something like that, because if um, part of the ch part of the way to get this to be legal, to get the Attorney General to sign off on this, <clears throat> is to uh, have it not be one of those things. So we are regulating a pipeline. We're not trying to regulate uh, a building or building code uh, in that way. Did I say that right, Doug? M Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, may I? Thank you. 90% uh, right, yeah. The, 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 one, the one thing I want to highlight is that um, one of the options being considered is the Building Board of Appeals, which is a body that is, um, under our current bylaws, hears appeals from the building code. But in the same section of our bylaws, uh, basically which regulates building matters, we also have our um, his, historic building uh, bylaw that protects uh, historically and architecturally significant buildings and contains a demolition delay, as well as um, some of our other measures that have nothing to do with the building code or the fire code or the gas code. And just because those things might be somewhat um, related to uh, building matters doesn't mean they don't have different sources of authority. So the gas code and the building code obviously come from state law. What we would be arguing here is much like our ban on uh, plastic bags, plastic water bottles of certain types, that we're trying to regulate a very specific concern that's not covered by state law. And the fact that it's not covered by state law is why we're doing it. Um, there's a slightly different reason why the Zoning Board of Appeals is not a feasible mechanism. It is one thing that we had talked about as well. And I just want to commend uh, these folks from top to bottom, uh, from folks who volunteered time uh, to look at a lot of the legal issues, to folks who have obviously volunteered their time to look at uh, a wide range of technical issues uh, to really come up with a comprehensively thoughtful bylaw that builds on what Brookline does, uh, has done, but it tries to tailor things for Arlington. Just so a, a few uh, sentences more, but I'll be brief. Um, part of the reason that I'm in favor of this is because the impact is actually so small, and um, which is uh, the flip side of that is that it's unfortunate. If you, if we're going to get to the 2050. Um, the, the, some of the things I learned at the Clean Energy Future Committee is that we have, we're going to have to, con we have to convert something like, it's like 450 or 480 buildings per year to stop being heated by fossil fuels in order uh, for uh, us to get that. And if you look at the numbers, what we're getting, you know, we're only getting 70 or so uh, per year. So this is, this is, you know, it isn't enough, but it's still, but that means it's still the right thing to do because it's in the right direction. Um, I'll stop there. Um, I just Carol. had a question for Mr. Dunn. Um, first, I'd, I'd, I'd say it's probably going to be more than 70, I would assume, with knock-on effects once we, we can't measure that. It's, we can only assume, so. But, but yeah, you're right. That's ambitious. But I, I, pre I appreciate that, that there is some pragmatism within uh, the proposal to, to um, get us started here. Uh, I think there are two question areas here that are in brackets, though, in the draft before us. I think that they both pertain to whether or not the appeals process would be through the Board of Building Appeals or the town manager. Uh, town manager would be my motion. Town manager. For the exact, for the exact reason, um, because I, want to, I do not want to give the Attorney General the, the slightest excuse to turn us down. Madam Chair, could we ask the town manager uh, feedback on that? My opinion? <clears throat> I, I think that would be workable uh, in discussions with the article proponents. I don't think any of us expect there to be a large uh, number of applications uh, in this regard, and I would be able to rely on um, Ken Pruitt's expertise and other expertise within the planning department. I, I don't think it would be burdensome from an administrative point of view. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, to the microphone and your name for the record, please. <laughs> Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. I'm just curious, uh, I live in a, a house that has steam heat uh, with a boiler. Is this conversion for only forced hot air? Is it, does it only work for forced hot air? Okay. Um, so this only applies to new construction and gut renovations. So yes, um, in general, uh, heat pumps don't work for 
um, steam heating systems. They, they can't really get hot enough to boil water. Um, but in most cases, um, most new construction is installing um, central air, air for AC anyways. Um, so this kind of fits right into that. Um, retrofits are a whole nother sort of very big um, kettle of fish that we're not really getting into with this bylaw. Okay. Attorney Heim. Madam Chair, I just wanted to, um, when you take your vote, you've been clear about your pref preferred uh, appeal mechanism, but the folks had mentioned um, that they were still debating one issue, and so I just want to make it clear for the motion, uh, if the board is comfortable leaving that open in terms of what your final percentage will be with respect to residential um, renovation, I can come back with a vote and comment consistent with their final recommendation. Okay. Unless you're prepared to make that now, but it sounds like they're still discussing no, I, I, I Mr. Hurd. Is the discussions about the percentage going to increase or lower the, the percentage for the residential? Um, I would not want to necessarily commit us to anything, but from the sort of uh, conversation, initial conversations that we've had so far, probably would, it, would be, it would make sense to lower it. Um, you know, 50% would be, it would definitely not go below 50%. Um, that would be sort of commensurate with the with the commercial code. Um, we might want to, we might think about lowering it, lowering it, but still having it be a little over 50% such that like, if you have a duplex and one duplex undergoes a gut renovation, the other half wouldn't then um, be sort of covered by this. Um, so we're still trying to work those details out, but most likely the threshold would be lowered. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, on a, a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Any further comments or questions <clears throat> to uh, move approval, designate the town manager as the overseer for the appeals <coughs> and leave under, in the final residential percentage, um, a blank line um, that will um, designate at our next meeting for final votes and comments. Is that okay? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous votes. Thank you, Ken, Amos, and everyone else for appreciating this. Uh, next, uh, Article 16, vote establishment of town committee on auto and property insurance claims and losses. I think this was submitted by Mr. Fisher. Yes. <coughs> Just name for the record. Sorry. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Andrew Fisher. Uh, Precinct 6. I've uh, been a town, town meeting member since 1991. No, wait a second. Let's let everyone get out because I want to okay. make sure we can all Thank hear you. All right. The, the, this is your time to go if you want, <laughs> want to. Steve. Steve, go home. What? He's right there. Oh. <laughs> I thought I had one together. Can someone shut that door so we don't hear the conversation? Tell them the conversation's out in the hall, please. Sorry, I just, one second. And Ms. Ma, the, the minutes will reflect um, at the very beginning of our last agenda item, Mr. DeCourcy exited the chambers, and at the very end, after the vote and verbi, it's Mr. I'm just saying, for the record, DeCourcy returned to the chambers. Okay, if you could start over, I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Andrew Fisher. I live on Lombard Road, Precinct 6. Uh, I've been a town meeting member since 1991. And uh, I will be very brief, but I did want to say I started wrestling with the notion of insurance when I was introduced to uh, the Vision 2020 Standing Committee, which I attended every month for about 15 years, starting around 1997. And uh, I so much appreciate it. I would never have had the possibility of attending so many of the uh, meetings of the employees. Town of Arlington, an employee committee that offers, oversaw the self-insured health insurance plan, uh, which was so interesting. I had the opportunity to interview uh, John Marr and Ed Marlinga to learn how the uh, self-insured workers' comp program worked and uh, led me to read many of the uh, histories of insurance companies, which is fascinating. And over the years, I've been involved with several insurance claims as a home improvements contractor. Uh, so thank you for considering this article and for taking the time. 
The article asks for town meeting support to form a committee of volunteers who would can canvass Arlingtonians about the cost of their insurance premiums and claims. I talk with many, many people about this. They always tell me their, their experience and the cost of their claims. Uh, and I feel that if I had town meetings support, I could uh, organize a formal precinct by precinct uh, survey, at least in precincts that are interested. Uh, the project is completely focused on gathering information. Everyone I talk to uh, assumes that I want to start a separate town-based insurance program, and I don't think that's realistic. Uh, if nothing else comes of this, what we would have is a more informed community, and I think that's important. Uh, the project would propose no change in town operations and would not incur any cost to the town. All questions would be designed to respect privacy. I propose this action for several reasons, but the primary one is that we have so little no knowledge about our insurance costs that are specific to our town. And in the, in the information age, we have the capacity to learn it and record it. And I think this is an example of where the communities just have not caught up with the capacity of the fact that we have in-home spreadsheets. Uh, most of the knowledge that we do have is in the form of uh, gross estimates and averages. An example is that the uh, Insurance Information Institute publishes that the average now to insure a car in, in Massachusetts is $1,096. And we have 38,000 cars in town, so it's not fathomable that, that we pay $38 million. The police report that we uh, had about 740 accidents in town <clears throat> in 2018. Even if the real number was 1,000, that would mean $38,000 per accident. I do talk with people who are truly experts in the field and work in the field, and they're convinced that their budgets are cut to the bone. So the question is, where, wherein lies the truth? And I can describe similar information in the uh, realm of, of house insurance, but it just isn't time. Um, so my goal is that the next town meeting, we would report back our findings. It might be that enough people were not interested, but from, from all my conversations with people, they're extremely interested. If nothing comes of it, we'd be a more informed community. And our report would be to learn if the town wants to pursue it further or take any action. So again, thank you for your time thinking about this. Um, what, what would the makeup of the committee be? I know you say it's a, I believe you say it's, it'll be a town meeting committee, but what members and um, what, if any staff um, would also be expected to participate? Honestly, it would be a precinct-based affair. I would ask town meeting members at the precinct level if they are interested and if they can garner interest, I would work at it myself. And if any town officials wanted to be part of it or be informed, that would be excellent. But for the first year, I don't see any need to take any town, town officials' time, honestly. Just, just to be open. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess um, when we get to town meeting, you'll have that more crafted. Yes. Of what the committee, who's voting members, who's ex officio or something other, and it, it'll be an odd number in the end. Yes. Okay. When we had the... Meaning not even, not odd, but... Not when even. we had the town meeting, town... <laughs> Sorry, you got uh, it. <laughs> no, no water faucets. <laughs> um, when we had the uh, town meeting community-based health insurance study committee, we didn't take any votes. It was, it was just sheer gathering of facts. And what we found, the most glaring thing that we found was having so many different information, uh, insurance companies means that you don't have any central brain. You don't have any central repository of knowledge. Okay. And, and that was the main finding. 
All right, thank you. Um, before I turn to my colleagues, um, anyone else here on Article 16 regarding the Committee on Auto and Property Insurance Claims? If not, I turn to my colleagues. Okay, question. Oh, Mr. Dunn. So, um, why town meeting? Like, it, what, 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 what makes this, why, why do you think this is a good thing for town meeting to do? Is the, so there's a lot of fact finding and a lot of research that people do, you know, create like community, they create committees of um, excited, interesting people. Like for instance, the one we just saw, Sustainable Arlington, is, is parts of that are, you know, independent. Why, why, would, why should we do it as a town meeting, town meeting committee? Because I find that there is a lot of interest in town meeting. Um, it concerns the town. Uh, town meeting is a governmental body. Insurance in many ways governs us. Um, and frankly, if town meeting does support this, I'm able to say to people that town meeting is interested. Town meeting respects privacy issues but we also respect that there's a huge cash flow that we are obligated to support, and there's curiosity about how it works, where it goes. And does the auto insurance, come, uh, they, they, they claim a 40% overhead. If our schools work with a 40% overhead, it'd be an outrage. I believe schools are much more complicated to operate. Um, so there's, there's simply a lot of curiosity and support that I find. In, in town meeting. Um, Mr. Carroll. Thank you. I, I, I have kind of a similar reaction, and I know you're, thank you for coming. I know you're passionate on this. I remember you, I think you came to us over at the school committee talking about this at one point. Uh, I'm not school sure why, committee. maybe because of our fleet or what, I don't. I don't remember I rem school committee. Maybe it was incidental to a visit sure. you made. I, I remember many years ago the conversation. Uh -huh. um, but I think my, my question is similar to Mr. Dunn's um, <coughs> because tip, my conception of a town meeting committee is, is generally, generally um, a committee that's either going to lead to some policy proposals or is going to um, serve in an ongoing capacity, uh, advisory capacity around either policy or administrative actions or, 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 or what, what have you. Um, and I think I'm struggling a little bit on, on this because I'm not necessarily seeing the, the direct line with the policy proposal. Where I do see possible value, and I, I don't know if I want to put a representative from Vision Arlington on the spot here, but um, you know, where we do a lot of general um, data gathering about, about the town, about residents, is through the Envision Arlington Annual Survey. I could see something like this, possibly in the context of a, of a total cost of living type of analysis, where you include the insurance as one, one component of it, because obviously that's a lot, I mean, we were just talking a lot about cost of living tonight for some of our more vulnerable populations. And to me, it, it seems like maybe that might be the better route to try to, um, to design a survey and convince, you know, Envision Arlington that this, this is worthy of inclusion in the annual survey, which gets a lot of coverage, um, a big return, and then also gets, gets, you know, a lot of exposure at town meeting every year because those, those results are always presented to, to town meeting each year, so I'm I'm struggling. I think a little bit also um, um, with, with the idea that this would be a town meeting sta standing committee um, from from that perspective. But I, I see what you're getting at, and I think that if it were within the overall context of a, of a cost of living um, survey, and to my mind, most logically through the Envision Arlington survey, that that might make sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that you've thought about at <coughs> all, um, using that yeah. vehicle. Uh -huh. no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. It, it is a cash flow of somewhere in the neighborhood of $60 million. Yeah. And we're required in the case of auto insurance by law to carry it and by reality for yeah. the mortgage. Uh, 
the um, annual survey usually gets around 4,000. <coughs> and I'm hoping to get, yeah. pardon me? It does vary, so yeah, so. Right, 3,000, 3, 4,000, and I'd be more than happy to, to use that vehicle, but I'm, I'm really after many, many, many houses. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Hurd? Yeah, I don't want to reiterate points that have already been made, but you know, when I went through this article, this clearly an interest, and you have an interest in this. Um, I think that aside from insurance, there could be other expenses or whatnot that people face on a daily basis that could also benefit from the same data ga gathering. Mm -hmm. But I just haven't been able to come to the conclusion that a town meeting committee Mm -hmm. based on this type of data gathering would then come back and present something that would con would lead to any sort of policy change that town meeting would make. So I don't want to, you know, create a committee that reports to town meeting that then, but the report doesn't bear on anything the town meeting will then take votes on. Mm -hmm. Mr. DeCourse. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And then Mr. Fisher, thank you for your letter and, and the supporting information, and, and I tend to agree with my colleagues. I did a slightly different reason, too, is that the insurance companies are regulated by the state, so we don't really have any regulatory authority over an, an insurance company. I know you're looking for information here, um, and town council had referenced a resolution back in 2009, town meeting, um, where the town meeting had a resolution to request the attorney general's office to study the issue of municipalities as auto insurers. And just a question for town council, do you know if that ever was studied by the attorney general? Mr. Corsi, I don't know the answer to that issue, uh, uh, that question. I think that Mr. Fisher sponsored that article, I, I, so I'd be I curious did. to. And uh, it got nowhere. Okay. The fact that it got quite a bit of resistance from insurance companies. Okay, all right. Well, well I, I, I think, yeah. you know, part of the reason is you, you um, the state regulates insurance, and, and while the information may be best through an Envision Arlington um, type request, I'm, I'm, I agree with, with Mr. Hurd's comments that you hate to create a committee that, at the end of the day, there's really nothing that can be done through town meeting with the with the information. Mm -hmm. Okay, is um, there anyone here uh, that wishes to speak to Article 16? Um, if not, a motion from my colleague either uh, to move to approve or move no action, but I think what I'm hearing is refer this, oh, Mr. Um, I'm going to, I thank Mr. Fisher for putting it forward, and I think our comment can reflect that, but I'm going to move uh, that we recommend no action. Second. Uh, moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Um, and if the comments could include um, Mr. Carroll's suggestion, um, whether this can sort of envelop in with envision, as well as um, you may have a substitute motion at town meeting, and it goes back to your original intent. Okay. Um, okay, any further questions or comments by my colleagues? If not, an, a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we now go to Warrant Article 17, Establishment of a Police Civilian Advisory Board Study Committee. I believe this is a 10 registered voter warrant article. I'm sorry, I got out of I jumped ahead. I apologize. Let me get there. It is. Um, Mr. Weinstein, just name for the record. My name is Jordan Weinstein, uh, Precinct 21. Um, I'm also a, well, a town meeting member for Precinct 21 and also the co-author or lead author of Article 17 that, if passed, would establish a committee to study and craft a warrant article for next year's uh, town meeting that, if that passed, would create a police civilian advisory board. So the question uh, to begin with is why should we want to study uh, the creation of a police civilian advisory board, and I'd like to just offer some context and background. Uh, my call for such a board, or the call of myself and, and other supporters, comes out of recent experiences that you all know about where a member of the Arlington Police Department targeted immigrants and others in three racist, xenophobic, and hate-filled articles that ran in a statewide police publication which was also published online. And it's worth noting, I don't think it's been uh, discussed uh, uh, pertaining to this, but that these articles were published merely a year after Arlington as a town passed its Trust Act, 
uh, that declared Arlington a place that welcomed immigrants and promised them safe haven, haven within our borders. Such behavior on the part of a police officer employed by the town in a leadership position as he was should not have been tolerated. But for a variety of reasons that I won't get into now, the town chose to deal with this behavior by applying a restorative justice process that was never really meant to be used for police misconduct. The end result was that the officer in question remains on the job right now and the communities he verbally threatened now now wonder whether the town's passage of the Trust Act was simply an empty gesture. At the heart of the problem as I see it is the lack of an adequate process and procedure in the town for dealing with police misconduct. The way things are set up right now, except for the police department's own internal process uh, for processing uh, claims of uh, uh, misbehavior on the part of police or uh, complaints that they have, the town moderator has sole jurisdiction on such matters. And I believe, based on how the Lieutenant Padrini matter was handled, that this arrangement is no longer viable and it's inadequate. Civilian review boards have been adopted in Cambridge, in Springfield, in Brookline. They have a civilian review process. And Boston has an ombudsman uh, that takes these complaints outside of the police department. Had Arlington had a functioning police civilian review board or advisory board, as we're suggesting, in 2018, when these articles were published, an investigation into Lieutenant Padrini's behavior could have been launched. Such an investigation would have revealed that Lieutenant Padrini had had complaints made against him in the past. It would have considered the options or opinions, that is, of those close to Lieutenant Padrini professionally, including former police chief Fred Ryan, who advised the town not to use restorative justice in the case, because in his informed opinion, as we found out through a, uh, not a uh, similar to a freedom of information request, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Padrini, in his opinion, would not benefit from it. Such an investigation also would have revealed that indeed there was precedent established in Massachusetts elsewhere in similar cases to support the argument that the town could have prevailed on appeal if it had decided to terminate Lieutenant Padrini. So what are the details of Article 17 that we're proposing? It would establish a study committee, and I emphasize study, that brings in a variety of uh, very diverse cross-sections of Arlington bodies that would have a stake in the creation of such a board. It would include representatives from Envision Arlington, the Arlington Human Rights Commission, the LGBTQIA and Rainbow Commission, the Disability Commission, the Board of Youth Services, the Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, and the town moderator as voting members. Non-voting advisory members would include rep uh, representatives from the Arlington Police Department, the town's diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator, and the town council. In constructing the study committee, we sought to make it as broad-based and inclusive as possible and give it wide latitude in its decision-making. Now, I anticipate that some may speak against the proposal because it has a mandate included that the study committee do more than simply study. We deliberately included language requiring that the study committee craft a warrant article for the 2021 town meeting that would, in fact, create a police civilian advisory board. Now, the nature of such a board, its powers, who sits on its seats, and what it is authorized to do would rest solely with the study committee and ultimately with town meeting. But we're convinced that we do need to do more in this case than simply study the issue. We need some kind of systemic change. Finally, I'm aware that there is a proposal to create a police chief's advisory committee, and I wholeheartedly support this initiative and feel that our proposal to create a civilian advisory board would uh, work well with it. While the police chief's committee fosters communication and collaboration among the many town stakeholders and is an internal uh, body within the Arlington Police Department, our civilian advisory board would offer a safe venue for resident complaints against police misconduct and a body outside the police department and the town governance to <coughs> investigate them. Thank you. I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Um, 
If I could, just because it was referenced and then go back, if I could ask the police chief um, to address the, her recommendation for the chief's advisory committee. Just so we have both before us. <coughs> thank you, and I'd like to thank Mr. Weinstein for um, bringing this forward. Um, I recognize that for any police agency to be successful, we need the input of the community. And I recognize that for us to be successful in Arlington, um, we need to work closely with our community um, going forward. Um, I would like to um, propose, I have a proposal to share with you, and I would like you to consider um, implementing a police chief's advisory committee. Um, I've been researching this for the past couple of months. Uh, it's been one of my uh, missions to take on, uh, um, to bring this to the police department and the community. Um, I've researched best practices from the IACP, the Police Executive Research Forum, and, the, and I've studied the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. I believe that a police chief's resident advisory committee on 21st Century Policing would be extremely beneficial to the town. In an effort to further our mission of building and maintaining community relations, building trust, fostering cooperation, and increasing transparency, I would like to form this commission to involve residents of Arlington in the overall mission of the police department. I envision creating this committee consisting of 11, 11 to 13 community leaders, including uh, members from the Human Rights Committee, the Diversity Task Group, um, Arlington Public Schools, um, Student Council Leadership, I listed a number of um, representatives in my memo, and um, it would provide a forum for discussion and present the Chief of Police with a diverse spectrum of viewpoints represented by community members. The mission of this committee would be to foster open communication and cooperation among community members in the police department, and the commission would be tasked with advising and making recommendations to the chief of police, enhancing public community relation, relations by serving as a liaison between the police department and the community, in reviewing and making recommendations on policies, procedures, recruitment, training, culture, and programs. Working with the Chief of Police, the committee would identify areas of focus, including homelessness, the opioid crisis, immigra immigration, police officer safety and wellness, and best practices, as well as any other um, trending issues in law enforcement. As part of my research, I um, have consulted with many law enforcement leaders, including um, law enforcement leaders from Boston, Chelsea, um, Brookline, Cambridge, and Somerville, and I consulted with the um, president of the Massachusetts Major City Chiefs, um, Chief Kais, who reinforced my belief that this initiative is progressive and an excep exceptional model, um, and he's quite familiar with a similar model at Framingham Police Department. Um, in addition to forming this committee, I would engage the services of a consultant with experience in developing benchmarking standards and a comprehension, comprehensive evaluation instrument to measure the effectiveness of the committee and ensure the goals and objectives of the committee are accomplished. And I believe through um, forming this committee, in addition to our state accreditation assessment, we'll continue to move the town um, forward as a 21st century policing department. Um, um, just commenting on um, Mr. Weinstein's um, research he's done for Boston, Cambridge, and Springfield. I believe that Arlington is a very different community, and that's really comparing apples and oranges. Boston police um, has 2,500 police officers. Arlington has 70 police officers, and we're completely different communities and, um, and, and address different issues in crime um, in this town. So I'd like you to, um, I respectfully request that you consider my proposal, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Before I call on anyone else, any questions at this point, or should I? Let's hear. Okay. Um, is there anyone else here on Article 17? Just name and address for the record. Yeah, Louise Popkin, 9 Cliff Street. Um, I'm reading this for Rajiv Soneja, who some of you may know as one of the co-chairs of uh, Diversity Task Group and as a member of the Human Rights Commission, although he wrote this as a resident. Um, I, Rajiv Soneja, write this in support of the warrant article proposing to explore the creation of a civilian police advisory board for the town of Arlington. 
I'm sorry I can't present this in person as I will be <coughs> at an Envision Arlington Diversity Task Group meeting called for the same time. One of the recommendations that came out of the report filed by the Consensus Building Institute was the creation of a civilian review board to provide advice and accountability regarding community police relations. As we know, that report was commissioned by the Town of Arlington in the summer of 2019 in response to the controversy regarding the racist writings of an APD officer and the process that followed his suspension and reinstatement. If created, the board would be an independent channel through which <coughs> residents could report grievances and complaints. I appreciate the hard work the APD puts into effective policing and community relations, and this board can be an important tool for building trust and a sense of safety within the community. My hope is that it will contribute to greater transparency and more open communication between town residents and our police force, since identifying and dealing effectively with individual cases of improper behavior benefits everyone concerned. Thank you for your attention to this matter, Rajiv Soneja. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Lynette Culverhouse. Um, I, I just want to say, while I appreciate um, the proposal from the chief um, tonight, um, I have to ask myself whether it's not happening just because we've proposed a um, civilian review board um, and the importance for an independent place for citizens, especially those who live in fear to go with their complaints. So I'm actually here to read a statement from Laura Kiesel, who is unable to attend. Um, so I'm unable to make it tonight due to coronavirus concerns and related health needs. But last time I attended a select board meeting, I spoke of my uncle's assault by police officers. What I hadn't had time to mention then was that neither my uncle nor my family reported or filed suit regarding the abuse. Despite the privileges of being white, American-born, and native English speakers, we felt too disempowered and, quite frankly, too scared of the backlash and additional targeting we might incur if we were to file a formal complaint. Had there been a civilian review board in New York City at the time, things might have been different for us. Unfortunately, my uncle is not the only family member of mine to be victimized by police. My brother and his friends had been repeated targets under Mayor Bloomberg's stop and frisk policies in New York City earlier this century. Like with my uncle before them, though, they had no recourse. The truth is, the best studies that exist, which are sparse, show that those who are targets of inappropriate treatment by police rarely, if ever, report it. This is why I took it with a grain of salt when the town manager told me last spring that Lieutenant Pradurini had no past history or record of anything that would be concerning, which is why he was offered so-called restorative justice. However, a Freedom of Information Act request I filed yielded a 200-plus page disciplinary record on Lieutenant Pradurini. Though much of it was redacted, what text was available painted an unsettling portrait of an officer who had multiple allegations of threatening or negligent behavior towards civilians and citizens in his custody. Perhaps the town manager and I have a difference of opinion over what qualifies as concerning in one's record, because I not only found this to be concerning, but extremely alarming. Up until this point, I had, despite my personal fam familial history, felt safe in Arlington, and that the APD was different than what I'd grown up knowing. But upon reading that report, I lost all faith in this institution and the town government that seemed to prioritize protecting it over concerned and vulnerable citizens. Having published on this issue in the context of the APD, I am now associated with it in the town as a public figure. This means I have been the recipient of a steady trickle of emails and people stopping me around town to share with me their own stories of having been witnesses to or recipients of mistreatment by members of our APD, including Padrini. Like my family was so many years ago, they are too afraid to go public with this or to report it 
in our town, especially after the leniency with which Padrini's hate speech was viewed as being treated. Despite the findings of my investigation, I still believe the majority of the ABD are comprised of good cops who genuinely care about the residents they are sworn to protect. The problem for me and so many others, however, is we have no way of knowing who, are the bad ap who the bad apples are. And so I, like many others, now live in fear and trepidation in the town we call home or work in. We are reluctant to call the cops, report incidences, or even be in the presence of police. This erodes public safety in our town overall and is not a sustainable long-term situation. I am sure that all of us would like to have healing and restore mutual trust here in Arlington. If, like the select board and town manager have repeatedly assured us, the APD is a generally trustworthy body with cops who abide by a certain code of conduct, a civilian review board will simply confirm that for all of us and give us peace of mind. However, it will also serve as a check to those officers that may otherwise be acting below the radar and that do harm others or put vulnerable people at risk. Such a review board then can help prevent a situation like what happened with Padrini from happening again by catching troubling behaviors by officers early on and bringing them to the light. A civilian review board will allow those of us from vulnerable populations to feel we have an authority to appeal to if or when we have need of it. Its existence alone could be a critical tool in restoring the faith of many in the APD and the town and rebuild bridges that have been burned. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? I'm Elizabeth Drake on Jason Street. Um, I'd like to preface my comments by acknowledging the positive relations that have been built with um, the police department and with the town manager in the last six months. Um, and I don't want you to interpret these comments to be that I don't appreciate that and don't want to continue to, to work with you and your departments in the future. Um, because we are, we're talking about the past, but it's important that we talk about the past so that we don't uh, repeat it in the future. So I'm here to speak in favor of the warrant. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that on these chambers on October 28th of last year, our town manager thought, thoughtfully responded to the petition put forth by many in the Arlington community. And when, we addressed, or when he addressed the final request to develop a plan for the establishment of a racially and class diverse civilian review board, he responded that it's generally not the town manager who tells the community how to govern itself from a structural point of view. That said, I would be very happy to facilitate the process of considering such a proposal if it's brought forth by the community. So here we are, <laughs> here it is. And so I hope that you uh, can all consider moving it forward. Um, one concern I have heard about this warrant is, uh, and, and Jordan addressed it, is a specific specificity <laughs> of it, that it is not written to um, study whether or not a civilian review board is needed, but it is a warrant to study what kind of civilian review board will be put forward. It does not leave room to decide if one is needed here in Arlington. And I know that that was done intentionally, because there's no doubt after the last 17 months that a civilian review board is needed here in Arlington. And the question is what kind? What kind will work best in the Arlington community? And that is what this warrant is for. Arlington needs to be prepared for next time because it will come in one form or another when the Arlington Police Department is faced with another situation like this or an allegation of misconduct, we will have a clear path forward with an increased role for the community to play, a transparent structure, policy, and rules. We need to form a plan now to avoid the kind of fracture of trust that resulted from the mishandling of the previous situation. Arlington's reputation cannot afford another bruising blow like we have suffered. And there is no current mechanism in town that I'm aware of, and 
uh, for community input and oversight in these matters. There's no place for community members to come forward to be heard and to voice their concerns. And again, I speak of the past, and I know that the select board and town manager have, have moved forward, but I think it's important that we address the past and learn from it. Because when we came forward, when the concerned citizens came forward to these chambers and spoke to you about our outrage at the inappropriate use of restorative justice, when we came, the brave residents who shared their fear with you, we were met with disparagement. We were belittled, we were interrupted, and most outrageously, we were blamed. The inability to empathize with us and take responsibility for the mess that we were in shows that Arlington residents need, deserve, a better way of dealing with police misconduct. And this warrant will ensure that. After the mess of the last 17 months, Arlington residents deserve to know that this will not happen again. And I want to add that I really do appreciate the um, proposal put forth by Chief Flaherty. I think it's fantastic. I think it would make a great sister committee because it gets to communication and building that trust with the town again, which is really great. I'd like to see it represent more uh, or call for economic diversity and um, a diversity that reflects the racial and ethnic uh, diversity that we have in town. I'd also like it to specifically contain um, or involve people of, cover, or people of color and people in the recovery um, process. But other than that, I, I really think it's great. So thank you for putting it forward. Thank you thank for you. your time. Thank you. Um, We'll continue on. Um, just be mindful if, if it's already been said once or twice, if you could, if you want to say it again, you can. We do have six other warrant articles, but please feel free. And I'm letting people go. They're really um, getting up there in minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Kate Tranquata. I live at Park Avenue Extension. And I'm here reading a statement from Gwen Wong, who lives on Lowell Street. She um, had concerns about the coronavirus and so couldn't be here today. So Gwen says, according to the Pew Research Center in a study of American police departments published in 2017, a key finding was that a majority, 72% of officers say they disagree or strongly disagree that officers in their department who consistently do a poor job are held accountable. So seven in 10 American police officers reportedly feel that their departments are unable to discipline poorly behaving officers and those who are doing a poor job do not get the appropriate discipline or training, counseling, or coaching. These self-reported trends in behavior in police departments from across the country demonstrates the need for civil re civilian review boards. They give town residents the authority to review and recommend discipline of police officers. On the Springfield, Massachusetts website, it describes the purpose of their civilian review board quote, review and recommend discipline of police officers where warranted on all civilians' complaints involving allegations of harassment, use of unreasonable or excessive force, use of language that is insulting, demeaning, or humiliating, discriminatory treatment based on a person's race, religion, national origin, sex, age, sexual orientation, or disability, or retaliation against a person for filing a citizen's complaint, unquote. Our town needs a civilian review board so that the town can complete the disciplinary process of Lieutenant Padrini and have the system in place for any future complaints. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, Adam McNeil, Precinct 4. I just wanted to add to the small point, as in a lot of ways I look at this as a kind of a small d democratic matter of bringing a greater governmental or governmental um, institution uh, accountability back to the people in, in a representative. In many ways, I see this as a parallel to the um, Warren article last year that moved the police or was moved to move the police chief out of civil service. I think there's a lot of powers in that. I think it's in the general, outside of the uh, specific incidents that have been spoken to, I think that's an important point to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm a fairly new resident of Arlington. Um, my husband and I moved here from the North Shore last year. Um, one of the only things I knew about Arlington before moving here was about the racist, xenophobic remarks that Padrini had made, and it didn't really make me want to move here. Um, I don't generally trust the police just because of what 
uh, experiences I've personally had with them, with experiences that friends of mine and family members have had with them, and the fact that Padrini was allowed to remain on the police force just sort of confirmed that for me. Um, I live in a community with a lot of people of color, a lot of people with disabilities, um, a lot of LGBTQ people. We don't call the police because of the sorts of things that are happening with people like Padrini. Um, I don't think that the Civilian Review Board will solve all the problems that are inherent in police departments. I think it's a good first step. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that the proposal put forward by Chief Flaherty is the right solution um, because it seems as though the methods that you're proposing would be fairly up to you um, as to who would be appointed, who that consultant. You have to address the board, sorry. Who would be, con who the hired consultant would be, would be up to the police department. Um, so therefore, you would get to decide who that is, who that company is. I think it really should be up to the people, uh, since you are policing us, and we should definitely have some say in what goes on, especially with, uh, again, people who are making remarks like Padrini has over and over and over again. Thank you. Hi, Robin Bergman, Park Avenue. I just wanted to make a brief comment in favor of the review board. I don't feel that, um, I feel that it would be important to have it as an independent body and not as part of the police department. I think that the other suggestion, the other proposal could work hand in hand with it. I don't see them as exclusive. Um, but I also wanted to make the comment, someone made a comment earlier that we are totally different than Cambridge and Springfield, that it's apples and oranges, and I just wanted to point out that Brookline is closer in size to us and that there are ways of crafting this so that it is the appropriate structure for a town our size. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. So Krista Kelleher on Medford Street. In the last year, I've come before you to ask for your support of measures to make sure that Arlington is among those communities which are leading on matters of access, inclusion, and equity. So I've advocated for the creation of an elect election modernization committee and for the provision of school committee stipends. I now ask for your support of a committee to create a civilian advisory board and to ensure that the principles I just mentioned, access, inclusion, and equity, are realized along with the principle of justice. It seems very important at this time in our town's history to develop a mechanism for resident engagement and input on public safety personnel and operations. Such a body must address the needs of all of our town's residents and acknowledge diverse perspectives that may be connected to one's gender identity, immigrant status, race, ethnicity, religious, cultural, or linguistic background, disability, class, sexual orientation, age, and or military status. The body should provide an effective means for fielding concerns of those living and working in our community, and it should ensure that procedures and policies are carried out properly and that accountability is maintained. If created and implemented in a way that is inclusive and reflective of our, of our community's values, there is great potential for such a mechanism to be a significant resource to the entire community, including residents and those serving as public safety officials. As someone who believes that study committees can provide a roadmap for policy reform and implementation, I remain hopeful in the opportunity that lies ahead should this committee be established, and I think that a study committee would help us to accomplish the goals that we would like to see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Council Park Esperian, a meeting member for Precinct 18. Um, thank you. Can you speak into the microphone? Yes. You want, and can you pull it up also and, and address the chair? That's Thank you, Chief Flaherty, yes. for what you had to say. Uh, what you had to say, I think, is honorable, mm -hmm. and I respect you for that. But that's one body. You're I'm police. sorry, sir. Can you just address the board? Okay. The, the police department is one body. I'm a retired public school teacher, but I think the citizens of our community have a right and a responsibility to account for those civil servants who we pay for to provide services to our community. It seems reasonable to me to provide some uh, empowerment to the public, and not just to the police, to make that determination of what is going on 
and to be transparent. Now, I don't want to go into details. I think I can pretty much sum it up. I think this is a reasonable approach. And honorable people who are in the police department, and I thank you for coming here, should not be fearful of civil participation of the public to be involved in this decision making. This is something as part of democracy. You know, we don't live in authoritarian state. We don't let one force determine what the rules should be. And if we do, we are in serious jeopardy. And we talked about a president who takes authoritarian power at times, and we object to it. I think we need to be responsible for our own communities and be true to the, the views and the values that we have and not be hypocritical. And I think this issue with Officer Padrini is going to continue unless the select board has an other way of addressing this. I think what um, uh, Mr. Weinstein said is absolutely right. And I think it's reasonable to approach this. And this is something that can be discussed and resolved in a positive way. And if the community cannot get involved in this or not permitted to be involved in this, then we don't respect democracy. That's all I need to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you have a Hi, I'm John Gannell. I'm also a new resident in Arlington. And um, I think respect is a really good way to think about this. We brought up the issue of public trust a lot, but uh, how do you have trust without respect? And how do you have respect without a sense of mutual responsibility? And I think that a civilian review board would be an excellent means for the community to take responsibility for itself instead of being in a position that's a paternalistic relationship with the police, where they're merely sort of left to accommodate public relations responses instead of actually playing a part in how decisions are made. Because no matter what, you're going to have a, some sort of relationship of resentment as long as responsibilities aren't shared. That was the operative tone of Lieutenant Pedrini's address uh, in the screeds that he wrote was uh, contempt, profound contempt for members of our community. And so, of course, our community is going to be uncertain about how the police are going to be behaving in the future. Um, and I think the only way that you could conceivably allay those fears is by coming up with a solution that is lasting and structural. And that's what this is what, that's being put forward. Otherwise, you're going to be putting out fires again and again uh, in perpetuity. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Beth Malofchek, um, 20 Russell Street, and I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 9, and I'm here to speak to you to encourage you to respond favorably to Mr. Weinstein's article. Um, I think it's very important to start the healing process. The request is not to establish a civilian review board, to, but to study it. And I think that um, were it not for the, what's already been stated about how certain incidents or writings were handled, we wouldn't be here. And we're not going away. And we believe so strongly in Arlington as a holistic and welcoming community. And we want that reflected in our um, town administration. I think this is an integral step to achieving that. And I, I thank Profe uh, Chief Flaherty for her idea, but again, I think it could be, as Elizabeth stated, a sister component, two components working perhaps compatibly, but I do think it's essential to have a civilian review board independent of, um, uh, independent, again, uh, crucial components of a healthy democratic municipality. So thank you for your uh, listening. Thank you. Um, I do want to also 
um, enter into the record, we have an email um, from Peter Katzen of Beverly Road, um, writing to voice his strong support for the proposal in the Warren Article 17 submitted by Mr. Weinstein. Uh, we also have correspondence from Damon Bassetti of Yale Road, also writing to register support for Mr. Weinstein's proposed Warren Article 17. They could not be here tonight. Um, Mr. Dunn. Um, I have a couple of questions for the proponent, if that's mm -hmm. appropriate. Um, thank you for bringing it forward. And uh, one of the things that has struck me as I've listened to both uh, what you said and you know, some of the other proponents is the, use, the interchangeable use of advisory and review. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. To me, the, the, they feel like different things. And uh, tell me, and, and you use both, but the language is advisory. So I'm curious what you're thinking on that. Is. Um, I think that the, the title of uh, whatever is created is really not uh, uh, important. Uh, because, frankly, the study committee will determine what kind of powers a, uh, ultimately a civilian advisory or review board will have. Um, so uh, it really was just a judgment call on what to use, what kind of language to use. Okay, thank you. Um, and so my second question is about the membership itself. So the way this Warren article is written is it's very prescriptive. Like the vast majority of the Warren articles come across as saying, we're gonna talk about this particular topic. And then on the town meeting floor, we like, or either in these hearings and then subsequently town meeting floor, they can be amended as you know the will of the body. But this one, this article is written as like my way or the highway. There's nothing else, there's no, like you can't, we can't amend it as why, it's written. Why can't it be amended? Um, because in general, like so for instance, article 16, the one we, we just talked about, it says to see if the town will do a vote to establish, to learn a com to establish committee to learn the cost um, uh, or take any uh, action related thereto. So then it's like create a committee, you get to talk about who should be on the committee and what the purpose of the committee is and what the charge of the committee is. So on both in these hearings and, in, and then subsequently on the debate, you have the legal latitude. But when we have an, a Warren article that's written like this, if someone writes, a, a, if someone on the floor of town meeting says, I wish to change it from seven members to nine members, then the moderator is going to be compelled to rule that motion out of order because the Warren article specifies seven. That wasn't intentional? Um, the, the, the real intent was, if I might explain it, was to, first of all, this is a study committee. We're not creating I understand, but, a yeah. review board. Um, and the study committee, what we wanted to do was to create a small enough body that could function. So seven was the number. Um, at the same time, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible among the widest range within the, the number seven of uh, uh, other organs within Arlington that would have some stake in this. So therefore, the Human Rights Commission, Disability Commission, and Vision Arlington. Um, and we felt that uh, uh, based on some of the other ways that some of the other committees were constructed that there wasn't enough diversity, and diversity, frankly, was part of what we were looking for. So, yeah, okay. So I, I, I definitely appreciate the importance and value of, of diversity in a in a committee like this. Um, I'm just part. Of, I've got like like two thoughts that are that are hand in hand, but they're not exactly the same. One thought is, uh, is are these the right seven people? And then simultaneously. Why did you write it such that we can't, like the, the town meeting, for instance, can't even change it? Like, it, it is a my way or the highway, right, uh, the way it's written. I think I just answered the question. Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't know that that would prohibit town meeting, or we didn't know, from amending it if it wanted to. And frankly, if that was something that seemed to be the general consensus, I could make a whatever it's called, a friend of the court uh, resubmission. No, I don't you know. Can't. See, the, unfortunately, once the warrant is published, you, it, like, this is, like, this sets the boundaries of what town meeting can talk about. And this right. set the boundaries so narrowly that we won't be able to make it. Well, any of it. I, I do believe, what? It does say well, it does, or take any action related there, too. 
I, I, no. I mean, it will be up to the town manager, or the town moderator, gets the person who gets to decide what's in and out of scope. I, but I, I right. Yeah. I, I mean, if anyone in town meeting thinks that they could come up with a more representative uh, collection of uh, voting members of this, I, I would like to hear what they are. But we felt that it was very broadly uh, representative of all the all the organizations and organs that would have a stake in this, so, like, including including members non voting, but members a uh, member of the police department. Yeah, my concern isn't that it um, isn't the most possible representative. My thoughts are as, as I'm wondering whether it would reach the um, uh, like whether it's got good expertise and representation across different parts of the town, uh, and not well, what, do you, not what do you just, have in mind? Excuse, not just diversity is is I mean, diversity is obviously very important, but it's not the only uh, goal that I would have for the committee. What would you have in mind? Um, well, we can only really discuss what's before. Well, we, unless we you can, want. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I'm gonna leave um, that to you. I don't know. Well, it's a criticism that you're you're <clears throat> leveling. I'm just saying we have seven other ones. What, what your thoughts are? I, uh, I, I'll say. Like, so I don't. Uh, um, I, I come to these hearings not necessarily with knowing what I want out of them because I want to hear what people have to say. Well, I came the, here knowing what I want. Me, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, have, I, have, I resist interrupting, and I'm. Okay. Uh, Sorry uh, about that. I. Uh, I mean, and I mean, so part of a hearing is, you know, I listen to what people have to say, I listen to the people in the audience, I listen to the proponents, I learn things, and then I talk with my colleagues, and then I share, and, I, and I, this, these are, I ask you some really genuine and serious questions about the construction of the committee and, uh, and, and, and the naming of it, because I, because I, and that's why I'm asking, because I'm thinking that they're important. I don't exactly know what I think would be on this. Um, but I'm also not exactly a proponent of this, and so therefore I come here with an open and questioning mind. Uh, and I guess my final response is that if town meeting as a whole feels that this is not representative enough of uh, a town or doesn't provide enough expertise to uh, investigate this, then they can just they can make that decision. But I don't see any to I, I don't see the reason to use that as a, a reason for not recommending this to town meeting. Okay, um, and I just want to, we, we do have six more Warren articles and then we have nine more f Warren articles on the final review and I want to be respectful of everybody. Um, right now we're at the point, unless there's another question. Um, any, Mr. Kiro? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so I, I'm glad Mr. Dunn raised this because you do have the phrase, take any other action related there too. Unfortunately, I think it's a technical error on your part where it's placed because that phrase, what it means is that town meeting probably has a latitude on the charter of the committee, probably has a latitude on how many people are on the committee, but that's it because everything below that doesn't, doesn't have that proviso. So mm -hmm. you, you, you've been around enough. Every time we propose a, a, a committee to town, town meeting, there, please, Let, no, through the chair. So, Please. The, the debate often centers around who the members are. Are they representative enough? Town meeting can't change that the way that this is written, which, which is a concern to me. And I'll, I'll tell you, let me say a little bit more about that. <clears throat> I think you have an excellent list here. Um, I question the inclusion of the town moderator because I'm not really sure what the town moderator's involvement in this would be. I, I think um, unless the intention is that it be a town meeting member which would be a great thing for us to be able to, to craft in the language. We can't as it's written right now. Um, I personally, and I'm sure others, you know, I'm concerned that there is a lack of three of the major stakeholder groups that, that really interact with the police department. So one that's missing is one of the most vulnerable groups in town, the Council on Aging and our senior citizens who rely, who are <clears throat> very liable to be taken advantage of and rely on, on um, community safety and rely a lot on first responders. So there's no representation here. Arlington Housing Authority or tenants is not represented here, which is a concern to me. That is, that is a very, that, that's a vulnerable population and also works closely with the department. There's a substation at, at um, uh, Monotony Manor. And the last is, um, what I don't see is, is um, any kind of school representation, which is also one of the large um, partners of the, of the police department. Um, I know the chief's proposal included student council representation, so we actually hear from the, the, the students. 
Um, so those are some things that I, that I see as far as substantively uh, with, with uh, that. Um, I do have concerns with assuming that we're going forward, with the, that, that the mission is to go forward with the, the Police Civilian Advisory Board. We do have latitude to change that charter. I think, I think, I read it that way, and counsel will correct me if I'm wrong. The last thing that I think is a technical deficiency is that there's no appointing authority here. There's no way? There, there, is, um, there is no appointing authority here for, well, let me see. Madam Chair, may I? Ms. Attorney Heim. Uh, Mr. Kuro, I believe that it's Actually, it looks like they're all representatives of standing committees. I stand corrected. So in this, this case, they're all standing I do, members. I, do want to I think the intention it. is that each of those it's commissions not. or committees would, would designate someone. Is that correct? That's correct, and, and I just want to clarify. They don't have to designate a member of, the, of their own committee. They right. could decide that you're correct and somebody from the housing authority or yeah. something, somebody representing the elderly should be yeah. on this. Yeah. So w where I am right now is that <clears throat> I appreciate you bringing, bringing this to us. And yes, it's true, of course, we're, we're talking about some alternate proposals because of the conversation that's been started over the last month. Of, co of course we are. Um, <clears throat> but I'll note that you know the chief's proposal includes a lot of the same organizations and groups that are here. Um, and I think that there, there could be a, a compromise or there could be an agreement reached between the proponents of this warrant article and the chief as to what the makeup of an advisory committee to the police department would be. That's, that's first. I think one thing that, that um, I would like to see, I'd like to see it specifically um, called out the town meeting member representation would be there. I'd like to see it specifically called out that at least one graduate of the Citizens Police Academy be there. I mean, we have all of these citizens in the town who have taken, what is it, six weeks out of their lives to, to um, Could I just, uh, participate? At the very no, end uh, of no, it. No, uh, one second. Wait, eight, there is one town meeting member that's required to be part of this. I don't all right, see. we need That's to keep end. it. All right, we can't go back and forth, and we we, we still have other warrant right. articles, six, fifteen other warrant articles to deal with. So, yeah. do you have a question, or do you want to? Well, my my proposal right. is that um, I'm going to move no action. I'm going to request. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the proponents get together with the chief to find a a formulation that would be worth bringing back to us. Because as I heard the chief, I didn't hear you, chief, and I might, I, I think through you, Madam Chair, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. need some clarification. I didn't hear whether you were asking for us to create a, a, a committee by the board's power. We can create committees on our own, or whether you were looking to do that uh, through, through your own devices, you yourself. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to move no action with a, with a suggestion that the proponents get together and work with the chief on a proposal that can be agreed upon, that can be brought back back to us for at least receipt or endorsement. Could I just respond to one thing? No, one second. Um, first, procedurally, there's a motion by Mr. Caro. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dunn. Mr. Hurd. Just on the, along the lines of what my colleagues have said, I think two, two groups, vulnerable groups, that are often interacting with the police are the homeless population and the opioid population, and the representatives that fight opioid ab abuse in Arlington. So I think that's another just deficiency in the makeup of this group that I think should be considered we come and bring it together. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> we have to follow a procedure. Um, any, Mr. DeCourse? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, and I, I apologize that I have a few things to say, and I realize we have a lot on the agenda tonight, but I think it's something that we need a little bit more discussion on. Um, so I, I look at this, no matter how we vote tonight, this is going to be decided by town meeting, you know, up, up, up or down, which is, which is fine. That's, 
Brute, you brought forward the, the Warren article. Um, just a question for the chief. In terms of the advisory committee, when, when do you see that? Uh, when would you like to establish that, or when do you want to establish that so when it would begin its work? You have to come to the microphone. Sorry, if you could step back, please. I'd like to move forward with that as soon as possible. Um, I know the proposal um, by Mr. Weinstein um, calls for a year to study and then possibly two years before the committee would be put together, and I think that would be valuable time that we would be losing um, in getting together with the community. So as soon as possible, and I would see establishing it by July 1st or around there. Okay, thank you. So, so I, I look at this, and, and I appreciate that the, the Warren article um, the chief just started. The chief just came forward with a proposal. And as I look at the membership of the study committee that, that you've proposed in the Warren article, Mr. Weinstein, and I look at the membership that the chief has proposed of an advisory committee, I realize they're different. I, I, actually, we don't know if they're different because we don't know what as proposed what would be put forward a year from now. But as I look at the membership, other than you have Envision Arlington, the chief doesn't. You have the Board of Youth Services designee, the chief doesn't. And you have a town moderator appointee, the chief doesn't. The other members, the other members are, are the same. The chief. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, well, let me finish, please. Really? Thank you. Um, chief has Arlington Public Schools representative membership of the student council, religious leaders, an elected official, um, a town council, and a police union representative. Um, and, and she doesn't have non-voting members, as, as, as you do here. But I look at this for the study. I'd, I'd like to see what the chief does with this over the next year. And let's hold her to putting together the committee. We have the membership. We'll see what happens in a year. If it, if it doesn't work out, you, we, we will know um, where that stands. And, 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 and there'll be a membership on it. But for some of the reasons, the, the um, other members cited and, and just um, some of the concerns I have, um, I'd, I'd support Mr. Curro's no action uh, vote. Could I? Um, Will no, I have a no, chance no, to no, say this, one more thing no, at, not, before you vote on this? Question. I, I gotta follow, if I do that, then I have to change it for everybody else. So um, I just need to, I need to. Wait, 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 I need to correct. I I'm, to, I'm going to have to ask you to leave now, please. I just need to I, correct. I, I apologize. But please, I, I just need to correct the record. Can you just follow the process, some, sir? Please just follow. The, no, I, misstatements unless have been somebody made. asks you, it can't go back and forth. We do. We have to be respectful of all the Warren article hearings we're having tonight. This will take um, 60 seconds for me to a, just a make motion. one statement. I don't see why I can't do that. Go ahead, 60 seconds. OK, number one. Uh, what is being proposed by the chief has nothing to do with what we're proposing. The Civilian Review Board is a venue for people to, citizens, to file complaints of police misconduct, and it's an investigative body sitting outside the department. So to compare them to say they're the same is absolutely I And I've suggested that, Mr. Weinstein, that they're the same. In fact, what I said is we don't know what, your, what the committee will bring forward because it, it, well, we, the proposal is kind of, to study it. Yeah, we kind of know, but that's okay. Uh, the other thing is that the, the grammar uh, or the placement of that phrase uh, to take any action related thereto was placed where it was for grammatical purposes, not to have any other reason. If you placed it at the end, it would absolutely make no sense the way Legally, it was written. Does, huh? yeah. Okay. Does. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing is Mr. And I'm just confused on one thing. Mr. Kiro's uh, motion of no action. Motion is no, my motion is no action. Right. My but comment are we, is, are we, is to encourage the proponents to work with the chief on the makeup and, and um, of the, the uh, resident advisory okay. committee that she has proposed. So we're not um, supporting the chief's recommendation? Or are we supporting it and also it, 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 her? It's not, the chief's recommendation really isn't before us for a vote. It's not she, before us. She's, I, I think what the chief is doing is she's getting up, s speaking not in favor of the Warren article, recommending us to say no action, but then as an aside to saying 
Um, she is proposing what has been cited as perhaps a sister committee, but to me it's the same committee, um, that, that this would be our action and she could begin the course of establishing this committee. Did you want to clarify? I didn't mean to speak for you. I'm sorry. That is correct. That, was, that is what I put before you today. And um, Madam Chair, could I have 30 seconds to um, just respond to Ms. Dre's comments about not having um, a procedure or a place to go with a complaint? We have procedures in place. We have policies in place. Um, we have professional standards, um, an Office of Professional Standards where we investigate every complaint. We take police complaints very, very seriously. Um, and for her to say that we don't have any procedure or place or any place to bring them um, is not correct. Complaints can come to me. We accept anonymous complaints. We accept anonymous complaint forms um, by email, by telephone, by, by fax, if somebody wants to drop a complaint off at the police station or to the town manager's office. Um, we investigate every complaint that we receive. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Ms. I'll be very brief. No, no. Um, just if the board would in indulge me. I, it does sound to me like bifurcating a vote on this article and perhaps asking the chief and whoever else the chief, chief deems appropriate to sit with the article proponents to discuss her proposal. Oh, sorry, I thought she was still standing right there. Uh, to discuss her proposal before it's finalized would seem prudent. I mean, I, I think our goal, at least from town administration point of view, is as the chief laid out, we want to rebuild trust. We, we, we want to restore things to the community. Um, so I think before saying let's establish exactly what the chief has put before the board tonight, I, I, think, it's, I think it certainly warrants a conversation with the article proponents, as Mr. Kiro suggested. Um, and so I think if the board would indulge it, I think bifurcating the article vote and then any action or endorsement on the chief's proposal would make good sense. Um, if I could ask the town manager or through the town manager, the police chief, just trying to get the warrant and everything done. Do you think this could be done by March, our, our next and last meeting? Well, I, I don't think what the chief or, is proposing has to be addressed on the warrant. Okay. Because it's not it's not the subject of of the of the specificity of the warrant article. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure something happens. Okay. Um, so, on a motion by Mr. Kiro of no action, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Any further questions or comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, unanimous vote. We now go to Article 20. We now go to the next warrant article here in Article 21, Vote Election Modernization Committee. I'm wondering, I think I'm okay in terms of taking a break. I can keep plowing through. Keep plowing through. Okay. A window? Is that window open? We're going to turn the AC on, Steve. Let's see if we can. I'm sorry, if you could just wait. Um, I guess go ahead. We're here to discuss Article 21, 23, and 24. And I'm James O'Connor, Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. And I'm uh, Greg Dennis, the Clerk of the Election Modernization <coughs> Committee. So, which would you, would you like to address Article 21 first? Sure. I'm okay. We uh, presented, and I believe you have on your desk, a written copy of the draft motions after talking to Town Council Heim. We made a couple of adjustments. Uh, the first and foremost, as we talked about in our previous report to the select board, that we felt we'd like to continue our... Um, Mission. Excuse me, um, so could you please take your conversation outside? We're now on the next Warren article, please. Thank you. As I said, we'd... Thank you, sorry. I, if you could, can you start over? I wasn't, I, I'm sorry. I understand. I apologize. 
Um, we, we felt we'd like to continue our mission until 2022. Um, one of the issues we addressed before was the ex officio status of some of the members and uh, which may have led to some members uh, failing to designate or to participate. Uh, we'd like to add two members. One, um, we had a request from the Arlington League of Women Voters that would like to participate as they have been longstanding and involving in elections. And the second is to include a new member under the age of 25 to be chosen by the Honorable Select Board. Um, and that's primarily um, this article to extend the time of the, the, the committee uh, and to establish it as <coughs> one person oh, that communicated with us said the original warrant article called it the Election Modernization Study Committee. Um, we felt that uh, we're already doing that, so we'd like to be the Election Modernization Committee with your blessing. Okay. Any questions? Um, anyone else here on Article 21? Any questions from my colleagues? Um, anything else you wanted to add? If otherwise, we're ready for a vote. Is there a motion by? Is there anyone else you want? Hmm? I said, is there anyone? Oh, I already oh, said sorry. that. No I one got up? OK. OK. Um, move approval. Or move recommend uh, positive action. Second. Moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Any further questions or comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. That's Article 21, Article 23. Article 23 is asking the select board to submit home rule legislation to change the way we elect town meeting members. And I'd like to ask Greg if you want to address this issue. Sure. <coughs> Um, so this would change and consolidate town meeting member elections when there is a vacancy and an unexpired term to be filled uh, during the annual town election. So today, if there's a one-year remaining or two-year remaining seat um, or seats, those appear in a separate election. And the result of that is there's often sort of some intrigue and gamesmanship over who's running for which seat, confusion on the part of new town meeting members seeking to run, and they show up and say, I want to be on town meeting and they're, they're asked, which seat do you want to fill? And, well, what's the difference? Well, there's no difference, you just have to choose. Um, so this would take away some of that uh, gamesmanship and sort of inside baseball aspect <coughs> of running for town meeting and simplify the process. I'll add that uh, a number of towns already elect their town meeting members this way when there are vacancies, particularly towns that have had a, the opportunity to revise their charter, revise their charters, excuse me. And it is also um, the same mechanism we use to elect town meeting members when um, districts are redrawn. Okay. Um, is there anyone here on, oh, I jumped off the thing, Article 23, Mr. Dunn? Uh, just two comments. So one is, just if I remember correctly, all right, so you're not trying to change the way for an interim appointment, um, it's appointed by the remaining members of the precinct. Correct, no, we're not no. changing. Okay, yeah. and the second thing I wanna point out, I'm pretty sure it's next, uh, uh, so when we redraw the precincts, the affected precincts follow exactly this process, and uh, just I know you know this, but just reminding everybody else, so that means that uh, like all 12 people get chosen at the same time on the same ballot, and it just does it in order of, of vote. So having joined town meeting the first time in exactly that, and I received the 12th, least number of votes and thereby got on uh, town meeting the first time. Um, and so and, and that's actually gonna trigger next year. So for a lot of times things, this uh, precincts, this isn't even a trigger for, until, for two years, even if it's approved. Yeah, I realize I didn't actually explain it. It's where the most vote, top vote getters get the longest terms and so on. Um, and the other sort of odd result of the process is sometimes you have someone not be elected with say 100 votes and somebody with a couple write-in votes gets in. And, in general, we prefer if the person with the most votes wins. Uh, move approval. Oh, sorry. That's uh, I'll move by second. Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Mr. Kiro. Thank you very much. I very much support this. I mean, I think we've seen there's, there's been confusion at times, individuals wanting to run for town meeting, not realizing there's a one-year seat, there's a two-year seat, there's a three-year seat. Um, I just had a quick question about the, um, the issue with the, ties you're referring to um 
the, uh, the caucus, when you talk about a precinct ballot administered by the town clerk, will determine the division? Right. Yep. Yeah, the, the caucus. And, and that caucus is in also state law in terms of how we how things are done during uh, when precincts are, redraw are redrawn. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions and comments on Article 23 from my colleagues? If not, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, second by Mr. Carroll. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And those opposed, unanimous vote. Article 24. Article 24 pertains to a request for home rule legislation um, pertaining to ranked choice voting for town elections. And uh, we'd like to address that. You want to? Sure, this would uh, apply to any town-wide office. We're excluding town meeting um, because we have this other concurrent change we want to make to town meeting and we don't want to conflate the two, this go around. Um, and for any single winner election where there's more than, um, when there's three or more candidates in the race or any, any multi-seat election when there's more candidates than there are seats, we would use uh, ranked choice voting to determine which seats, uh, which people were in those seats. Um, it's used in, uh, we've been here before, but you know, it's used in 20 states for, in, for political elections um, in different jurisdictions. And we think it makes sense in terms of encouraging new and diverse voices to seek office. We happen to have a lot of people running this year, but it's kind of an anomaly. Often town elections can be a little sleepy and we wanna, we wanna make sure that we have uh, new voices trying to run every year. Um, we have Article 24 before us. Any comments? My colleagues, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question. I remember you had presented this earlier, uh, that Mr. Dennison um, talked about ranked choice. And um, just a question on the, the standard or what you're basing the uh, transferable vote method is the number of countable votes. And, and so, just thinking, what about a situation where you have multiple seats and a lot of people don't choose, typically choose more than one, can't, well, not a lot of people, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> some voters will not choose all, if it's three votes, they may not elect to use all three votes. In, in a three-person race, is it one-third the threshold for before you move to rank, rank voting? Right, um, and one of the things about the draft um, that I should mention is that draft leans heavily on the term single transferable vote as sort of a term of art. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been advised by town council that we should probably just spell out the exact procedure in the, in the home rule legislation. Yeah, I, the, the experience around the country is that people do use the ranks a lot. So, you know, in Maine, in their first Democratic primary, I think it was 80% of voters opted to, to rank the candidates. Um, and so the question was, if people do not use the ranks, what then? How do you get to that threshold, to, to like the minimum threshold that you need, like by, by reordering votes? Right, so you eliminate the lowest, if, if, if no candidate reaches the threshold, then it, you eliminate the lowest vote getter and, and um, all of that candidate's votes would transfer to those voters' second choices. Okay. And, and so on until enough candidates reach the threshold. Okay. And, and so in a single winner race, you know, the threshold is a majority of the vote. In a two winner race, it's a third of the vote. And in a three winner race, it's a quarter of the vote. Because once you reach that, it prevents an additional, any additional candidate from winning. Thank you. Mr. Carroll. So um, <clears throat> I like this a lot. I think it gives your vote <coughs> a lot more power because we, we know that when we vote often, sometimes, often, when you vote for multiple candidates, um, even multi-seat race particularly, you may have some, some preference that you wish to express. So I think that you're able to, it's a more dynamic expression of the, the will of the voters. That said, I know that I, I, I asked you this yesterday to walk through how this would work in a, in a multi-candidate race. Um, and I wonder if you could just quickly summarize it again, because the, the biggest issue I see with this is voter confusion, the need for a lot of education and, and moving over to a, a system like this. For example, one question that I have is, um, <clears throat> if you go through the first tabulation and you know no one meets the threshold, you drop off um, the, the lowest vote getter, you then go to another tabulation 
um, still nobody's met, met the threshold. What if you go through, what happens as you start encountering um, votes for candidates who have already been dropped off? Is there next, the next preference chosen exactly. on that round? Yeah. Or is it, does no, it have yeah, to wait it, for the it next It counts round? towards the, um, well, one thing I should say about multi-seat elections is that it doesn't matter whether you're electing one, two, or three, the experience for the voter is identical. It's an identical experience. You see the candidates and you rank them in order of preference. So we're not asking the voter to do anything different, whether we're electing one person, two people, three people. They see the candidates, they say, this is my first choice. If they have a second choice, they say, this is my second choice. If they have a third choice, it's completely an optional power that they can exercise if they choose. Um, so your question was, uh, if their next choice has already been eliminated, yes. it, the, the vote always counts as the next candidate that's still in the running. It's still in the running. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there a motion? I move, I move uh, favorable action. By Mr. Kerr, is a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hurd. Any further questions or comments? Or if not, on Article 24, motion to move approval by Mr. Kerr, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you for waiting. I'm now going to um, temporarily put Article 26 on the table and have Article 27 before us. Article 27 is home rule legislation, retired police officer details. Um, I can take it. Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this is brought before the board and then ultimately hopefully town meetings uh, Four town meetings consideration uh, based on an agreement the town reached uh, with the police bargaining units on offering uh, details to retired officers. Primarily from the town's point of view, uh, this would be beneficial because during summer months, during high vacation periods, uh, also coinciding with high construction periods, uh, we sometimes struggle to fill details. We often go outside of town and use officers from other communities to fill details, and sometimes we can't fill details. Uh, most notably, I would say this is, has uh, limited our ability to um, allow more crews to work from the gas company to do main replacement and also fix gas leaks from time to time. Um, we've tried to allow them to do more than other communities are doing, but uh, we still hit up against the availability of details. Uh, so I do feel like uh, having retired officers able to uh, be able to step forward and serve in this capacity would be a benefit to the town in getting important work done while keeping that work safe with the presence of a police officer. I'd also state um, there is no added cost to the town. Uh, detail costs are paid by, uh, if it's a town project, the town's already paying those detail costs. And if it's a private project, the private entity is already paying those detail costs. And retired officers would be required at their own cost to uh, participate in all the in-service trainings that would be required of them to serve as a detail officer, as well as uh, furnishing themselves uh, with, with uniforms and equipment. Get it coming from all angles here. Um, so I, I think, um, again, we've, agree we've agreed to this, uh, to bring this forward uh, with the bargaining unit, so um, that we feel strongly about bringing it forward, but I also think it would be uh, a value add for the department. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Brian Gallagher. We're really just here for questions, if you had any questions for us in regards to what that would look like. The town manager did a great job by summarizing everything that is in the plan for us, and uh, whatever you said is, is exactly what we have. Essentially, it's bolstering public safety at no cost for the town. That's really how it, what it adds up to. Um, is there anyone here? Article 27 is before us. <coughs> Again, just name for the record, sorry. Yep, Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. Um, so normally this wouldn't really be of concern to me. It seems like it makes sense to get coverage, um, but uh, there's nothing in there that says what would prevent someone from being qualified to do this. There's nothing about what their record is, whether they have retired uh, before they were gonna be fired or they retired early or what their, any misconduct in their past. To me, it's extremely vague and open and ripe for interpretation. Um, and I am very concerned that that is not part of it. Thank you. Then I call the House Draper Avenue um, and I would like to, I'd see no problem with this, except I would like to propose that um, 
officers that have disciplinary um, record or any record of misconduct be excluded from this. Thank you. Um, any questions, comments from my colleagues? If not, are you ready for, oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't see you there, Chief, I apologize. Sorry, I just want to comment. Um, offices in good standing would be eligible um, to work details upon retirement. Thank you. Okay, um, is there a motion? If there's not a question? Right. Move approval. Moved by Mr. Hurd. Move favorable there, action. Is there a second? Second. By Mr. Carroll. Any further questions and comments uh, from my uh, colleagues on Articles 27? If not, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dunn. Um, I, so I, I, I respect the question <laughs> that, that's being posed about, uh, and this is where I, I, I think people understand that I have a, um, I believe that we trust the chief of police, and if we don't trust the chief of police, we should fire them, and or uh, through, and, or and if we don't trust the town manager, we should fire them. And to me, that's my that's my control on these things. And um, if I and I, I don't, and even if I wanted to codify it, I wouldn't codify it as they have anything in their record, like any disciplinary action. It's too, um, it's too specific. And, and, and that standard is too low. So I, I just wanted to comment that I heard you and I thought about it, uh, but having been brought up, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the language because I respect, because I'm willing to assign the discretion to uh, the police chief. Okay. 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 And um, no, I'm sorry. We, have, we still have more business. It's, it's not a back and forth. It's, if there was a question, yes, but there isn't. Okay, any further questions or comments by my colleagues? If not, on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Carroll on Article 27. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you. We now return to, we uh, already voted Article 25, Article 26. Sorry, Madam Chair, just a moment. Just pull my notes. I'm going to let people that want to go, go. I'm sorry, which one? This is a water sewer. Um, okay, thank article, you, Madam Chair. We As now we, have Article 26 before us, Home Rule Legislation, Senior Water Discount, Attorney Heim. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As we previously alluded to, at present, the select board has clear authority as water commissioners to offer discounts under what's known as section 17D and section 41C uh, for property tax exemption criteria. Those are the kinds of water discounts that you can offer and they have a limitation on how much that can be. In order to offer further water discounts, including water discounts that might capture a larger uh, portion of the population, um, it's important to file this home rule legislation to clarify the select board's authority to um, offer this discount to seniors. The long and short of it is, is that the Department of Revenue has taken a somewhat conservative reading of a case about water rates that involves what circumstances in which we can basically charge a different rate for the same service and the same amount of that service. Because of the way those uh, other uh, discounts are phrased in the law, they're much more comfortable that the water commissioners of a city or uh, water commissioners of a town, in this case the select board, would have the ability to offer those, but not all. So the two things that you're getting out of this home rule legislation are potentially additional uh, water discounts and a potentially broader pool of folks who are eligible. Um, if you for me one second, I'm just going to pull up a note on the example. So. For example, um, this isn't a 100% accurate comparison, but so under uh, Section 17D, you need to be 70 or older, and you need to own or occupy a property for five years, and you have a specific asset limit um, and a specific discount that you can be afforded. However, under some of the other uh, property uh, exemptions that we've offered, for example, senior work off, the age limit is lower, and the, um, there's not necessarily the same uh, limit on assets. Um, similarly, uh, under 41C, you have to be 65. Um, you have to own or occupy for five years and be a resident for 10 years. But the range 
of income is perhaps a little bit low for who we might want to be able to avail themselves of this type of programming, where if we're talking about the circuit breaker or the uh, senior um, work off, the criteria for those things is a little bit more flexible and would encompass a broader, broader range of Arlington residents. So as the manager said, uh, you can already adjust, uh, provide some senior discounts, but this home rule legislation would expand your authority and make it very clear that you have that authority to offer greater discounts to a wider range of, of seniors. First, we have um, Lauren Article 26 before us. Uh, my colleagues, uh, questions, comments, or what say you, Mr. Kira? No, I appreciate, I appreciate the, work, the work on this. Um, I don't think I have any questions. I mean, I would note that there are some communities that, that also extend us to fully disabled that looks like we probably don't have the latitude as this is, as the proposed vote is written here. Um, and I know that we've talked mostly about low-income seniors, but I don't know if that's, if we want to retain that latitude. Uh, what do you think? Home, home rule? I, I don't, Madam Chair, may I? Sure I don't think we have the authority under this article to, to extend it okay. to. Okay, that's fine. This, this gets at the thrust of what I think we've been talking about, means-tested seniors, I think. So Thank you for the work on it. Is there a motion? Thank you. I, I, I move uh, favorable action. By Mr. Kiro, is there a second? Second. By Mr. Hurd. Um, any further questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, on Article 26, motion by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Article 52, endorsement of parking benefit district expenditures. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll call the board's attention to a spreadsheet that uh, was on their desk, and I apologize that it wasn't um, submitted into Novus in time for Friday. Uh, so quickly, I'll, I'll walk through what you have before you. At the top of the sheet, you have our projected FY21 expenditures from the parking fund. Uh, that's the statutory fund that allows us to pay for the cost of uh, leasing the parking meters as well as administering the district. So you see how those costs are laid out, inclusive of the bottom line parking benefit district costs uh, projected at $200,000. Below that, you see our revenue projections, what we've collected, uh, what we had collected midway through this fiscal year, so FY20 through uh, December, 30, uh, December 31st, 2019, we had collected 282,000. We had uh, projected only collecting $450,000 uh, for uh, FY20, so we're far beyond that from uh, a projection point of view. So we've increased our projections for FY21 to $525,000. Uh, for FY20, you can see where we spent uh, where we have allocated funds uh, out of the parking benefit district. We allocated 150000 uh, for FY20, and the $36,500 amount was from pri the prior year's allocation that we asked the board and then town meeting to move to put towards Arlington Center sidewalks. So that's uh, Broadway Plaza and Arlington Center sidewalks, and those why, that's why those are two separate uh, figures. Below that, you see our FY21 parking benefit district proposed budget. Um, we're asking to set aside another 50000 for the sidewalk and Broadway Plaza improvements. We don't have bids in hand yet, so uh, we just want to put that there depending on how bids come back for the sidewalks. Uh, we've set aside $100,000 to start considering the improvements that have been recommended to Russell Common from the designer that had been hired uh, using parking benefit district funds in a prior year. Uh, continuing to put $10,000 aside for snow removal. Uh, $20,000 to uh, officially fund the seasonal planting and those planters that have been placed along the sidewalks in Arlington Center. Uh, $10,000 to support DPW efforts to water those planters and water trees uh, in the center district. Uh, and then again, uh, $10,000 for sidewalk cleaning. Uh, I will tell you there may be um, one small adjustment made to this to account for uh, $40,000 being included in the capital budget for the replacement of the parking kiosks in the lots in FY21. And uh, what we would likely do is put that expenditure up above in the expenditures and maybe make uh, an adjustment to how much we're putting aside for the Russell Common Lot improvements. I can bring back that final version under final votes and comments at the subsequent meeting of the board. Um, Article 52. Move favorable action. Moved by Mr. Kiro. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hurd. Any further questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, on Article 52, a motion made, move approval. Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. <clears throat> Article 53. 
We now have final votes and comments on Article 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 18, 22, 66. First, is there a motion? Uh, move to pull. Move by Mr. Carroll. Is there a second? Oh. Uh, and then we, if yeah, anything yeah. needs to be changed, I'm just. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Hurd. Um, anybody have any comments, additions, deletions to any of the final votes and comments? Mr. Uh, Carroll? Oh, yeah. I, I just had one. Um, I think uh, when we discussed Article 11 the last time, we talked about um, changing, actually, the um, article title to outdoor performances, although in further reflection, probably open air performances make more sense because we're not just talking about streets anymore. We're also talking about parks. Mm -hmm. So if um, uh, take care of that house, I touch the nerve here. Yeah. I just want to make I just want to make sure that um, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Attorney Hein. I just want to make sure that that's consistent with the article. Um, Sorry, let me just pull. Um, while you're looking that up, Mr. Co if I may, Mr. Carroll, did you have something else, or should I ask Mr. DeCourcy? No. Um, Mr. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I had a little time off earlier tonight, so I, I have a couple of um, just typo type things. And I don't know if, if that's something you no, just want to take care yeah. of with Mr. Heim offline, or, or no, do you I'm want to discuss it now? Um, so if I could, on, on the comment to Article 15, um, and, and these are minor, but might as well correct them. Four, four lines from the bottom, the sentence starting, meanwhile, mm -hmm. it seems highly likely there's a comma between highly and likely that should be stricken. You don't like highly, comma, likely? <laughs> and then in the next paragraph, I think, following a joint meeting, if we could put the date of that meeting between the, the board and the ARB, so following a joint meeting held on, and I think it might have been January 27th, but I... Mm -hmm. I, I Whatever that date is. So we'll we just approved the minutes, so. Yeah. It's January 15th. Yes. Okay. 13th. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It, and then two small ones, Madam Chair. Oh, if you our, don't do this now, it will be down at town meeting floor yes. fourfold okay. in time, so please. Okay. I may not have gotten everything. If, if the mm -hmm. discussion went longer, I, I would have had more. But <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. If I may, I. I uh, I'm sure. I also just want the board uh, to to know that I think in the last I think two years or maybe so we've been following a practice where once we've finalized individual votes and comments, we've gone through a whole separate editorial process to try to capture more of those typos, and so we'll put the final votes and comments back out to the board for a final review sort of final, final review, it also is an opportunity for anything that board members didn't vote on that they want to support to make those votes 5-0, not where there's been a recusal, but where someone was absent and they want to support support the board. So I'll make sure to get a revised draft. But oh, that's I, fine. All, no, no, all, all these things are very welcome. I, I yeah, really no, and, and, and I don't want to take up the, these are two small things. I can, I can take care of that with that Attorney Heim. We don't yeah. need to go through it. Okay, and now, uh, Mr. Carroll, Attorney Heim, had a question about changing it to outdoor? Open air performances. Open air performances. So, Mr. Carroll, I just want to make sure I understand. It's, it's, you want to change it to open air performance within the definitions, or do you want to change the name of the um, bylaw to open air performances? The, uh, yeah, the, yeah, Title Three, Article 18, street performance, is, is, is currently says street performances. And I think it, it should be saying open air performances with. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, thank you. Is that okay? Okay. Um, any further questions, comments? Um, if not, on a motion by Mr. Caro, seconded by Mr. Hurd to move approval of final votes and comments. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Vote. Votes. <laughs> Uh, correspondence received. Uh, is there a motion to move receipt by? So move. Mr. Hurd, is there a second? Second. By Mr. Carroll. Um, Madam Chair, I'll just add for the board's information that number 17, uh, actually I, I received the letter, uh, that exact letter as well, and I already referred it to Dan Amstutz to respond in detail to that resident. Okay. And uh, the request for traffic calming um, 
I assume that might be something that goes to TAC? I or? think we can refer that to Dan Amstutz for triage first and then decide whether or not it needs to go to TAC. Is that okay, Mr. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, I just I just did have a quick question though. What is the status of that of that crossing? Because the town meeting I know appropriated funds for it. So where are we in that project? Uh, that bid, bids have been received, contract awarded, finalizing start date, but we're trying we're assuming we'll start on <coughs> July first after school is out so we don't interfere with the Hardy School. Fantastic. I look forward to detouring on the way to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, with that in the uh, amended actions to refer both to the town manager, move receipt. Uh, any further questions or comments by my colleagues? If not, a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Carroll. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Unanimous vote. New business, Ms. Marr. New business. Attorney Heim. I have none, thank you. Town, town, almost said town council, town manager, Chapter. I have no new business right now. Mr. DeCourcy. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, very briefly. <laughs> um, two weeks ago, I talked about March Madness. The Arlington High hockey team sailed through the winner's bracket in the Super 8 tournament, and they will be playing this Sunday for the state championship at the TD Garden. Now, the time hasn't been selected yet because they don't know their opponent, but it's um, three years ago they won the state championship. My, my son was fortunate enough to be on that team, and it's a, it's a great day for the community if, if people can go, on, go out and, and, and root on the hockey team. So I want to wish Coach Missouri and the entire team best of luck um, and go ponders. What day again? Sunday, Sunday the 15th. And again, there's, there's a, one more game to be played to determine the opponent, and then, then they will select the time. Good luck to them. So. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Carroll. Very quickly. Uh, yesterday I attended the kickoff of Arlington Reads Together. The library put it on. Great program. Um, Esmeralda Santiago, the, the, um, the uh, author of um, when I was Puerto Rican, uh, spoke. Great, great talk. Great turnout. Great idea that the, that the libraries are, are doing. I know they partner with the Diversity Task Group as well on this. Um, where there are three community reads this year. There's one targeted adults one targeted at um, teens, young, young adults, and one targeted at um, children. And I know that some, you know, the children's books are being used in the schools. So just kudos to the library, and another great um, community read program and kickoff. And there's a whole program, they've got the whole program online of other events this month. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just two things. Um, I <coughs> believe I forwarded an email to the town manager. I'm doing it from memory. I believe it was from Cheryl Vosmer about the lights at night in the Heights, and I think you said um, Deputy Town Manager Feeney and someone else is working on that. Um, so, do you anticipate like that's that's something that's going to take <coughs> months? Or I honestly hadn't noticed, but I think it'll be a uh, sort of a gradual process. So uh, Jim Feeney did go out and do an assessment after we received that email. Uh, there's only five or six lights out, not the same quantity um, that had been. Uh, suggested by that resident, but uh, a few of them are awaiting uh, parts that are on order and should be received soon, so we should be able to get some up and running. Mm. Unfortunately, two of them were struck by cars over the past couple months, mm. so there's a little bit more work that needs to be done, but um, gradually we will be getting them fixed and back up and running. Okay. Should I answer that email, or can you, I'll, or I'll, you like Jim or someone? Yeah, I, well, your preference, but I can I can draft something up for you to share with the resident. Okay, like. and then um, if uh, through the town manager um, spoke briefly to to uh, the police chief when she was acting, but I said we have to wait till she's permanent. But um, now, because of a time constraint, I need to put this on the March 23rd. I think that's our next meeting. There was a individual. There were a group of people who held a fundraiser um, in Arlington, led by a woman named J.J. Gardner. Um, they collected proceeds, which they want to donate to um, one of Arlington's. Um, domestic violence funds for domestic violence victims. Um, they were told um, in order to, by someone from the police station, they say, that in order for, the, the ta for them to donate it, they can't do the outright don donation to that town account. They would have to present it to the board, and we would have to accept it. I spoke very briefly with Chief Flaherty about that um, and, and said, this is just my memory, so I could be relaying it wrong. The only thing is the terms of the check um, well, if that's the case, and we have to do that to accept this money that was raised, the check becomes null and void in April. 
Um, I was hoping I could get it done tonight, but we didn't. So if you could follow up with the chief on that, I know it's a lot of stuff. It, it's just this group, um, you know, they raise the money and they want it. But ideally, you look into it, you and the chief, and you can say, no, you can just donate it to that town domestic violence fund account. Yep. But if not, it will have to. Otherwise, you know, she said there's a time limit on the check, 60 days, 90 days, and it runs out. Okay. All right. I'm, I apologize for rambling. I should have. Um, um, before we adjourn, our next meeting is Monday, March 23rd, 2020. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Bye. So Mr. Carroll, seconded by. Second. Mr. Hurd, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote. Good night, Arlington. Stay healthy.